All right, we're now at the official start time, 10 o'clock central. Uh, I think people are going to keep arriving, especially as everyone's negotiating the um, technical details. But uh, Krishni, if I might deputize you to be our admittance doorkeeper, the porter, always important for a, a dramatic panel. Um, and I'll, I'll start by welcoming you all to this initial panel of the SES. I guess we're technically SES panel six, but on new approaches to spectatorship. Uh, I'm very excited to be welcoming you. I should give a quick brief introduction myself. I'm Al Duncan. I'm at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where it's currently a very gray and cloudy day. Uh, and I should also introduce my co-organizer, uh, Anne-Sophie Noel. Anne, can you say hello? Hi, everyone. So I'm Anne-Sophie Noel. <clears throat> I'm delighted to welcome you um, to the panel as a co-host and co-organizer. And I'm in Lyon. Can you hear me well all? Yes? Good. Yes. Uh, we had a group digital huddle yesterday, the panelists and I, and I uh, expressed that it's kind of a power move to share the screen and take over everyone's monitor, but it's one I'm going to do uh, repeatedly and uh, just without apologies in this session. Uh, can everyone see uh, the theater of uh, uh, Atticus Herodes? Good. All right. New approaches to spectatorship. So as others arrive, they'll know where we are. Uh, I'm going to offer some brief introductory remarks with Anne-Sophie uh, before we get into the papers themselves. Uh, I'll start by talking about the origins of this panel, the seminar, uh, which are both historically and theoretically rooted in performance. Uh, performance is how I first met Anne-Sophie five years ago when at the SES 2016 San Francisco, uh, we were both involved in a Silicon Valley inspired adaptation of Aristophanes' birds called, wait for it, the nerds. Uh, performance also introduced me to our other speaker, Christian Burns, back in Chicago in 2014 for production of Rudane's The Musical. Uh, Krishni was an inspired palaestra. I was but a lowly fisherman. Uh, but as actors, directors, and translators, all of us um, in improvised conference green rooms and beyond, uh, we've been compelled to place modern audiences at the forefront of our minds when we think about performance. But when as scholars, we turn to consider the crucial role audiences played in the performance cultures of the ancient Mediterranean, our understanding faces countless evidentiary and methodological hurdles. Many of these issues are concerned more or less directly with the concept of spectatorship. And we employ this term not in a way to privilege the faculty of sight other, over other sense modalities or mental capacities, which always are functioning with sight in complex ways, uh, rather, we're using the term spectatorship to highlight spectators' active, engaged, coordinated, and highly competent participation in performance. This is an active spectatorship that we're talking about. A work's audience, by contrast, may be readerly, implied, delayed, distanced. Its spectators, however, are manifestly present in the here and now of performance, collusively and collaborating, collaboratively co-creating the event alongside performers. Now, we're also encouraged by a recent cognitive turn in the humanities, which is casting new light upon performance studies in ways that mainstream classics is just beginning to embrace. Um, we think that performance and what it means in the context of our digitally mediated pandemic world needs to be reapproached. that we do need these new approaches to spectatorship. All right, Anne-Sophie, are you ready? Yeah. Take it away. Yes, thank you, Al. And before I highlight a few objectives for the panel today, I'd like to warmly thank my co-speakers. So it's been quite a long time since this unforgettable nerds production, which some of you may remember. So <clears throat> I'm truly delighted that five years later, we have maintained this connection and were able to set up this international collaboration. So this is particularly precious, I think, and even necessary that research can cross borders today, even though we, we cannot travel and meet in person. So thanks a lot, guys. And thanks to Marianne, too, who is joining us today as a respondent and panel discussant. So let me bounce back on the idea introduced by Al of the co-creation of the theatrical events by the spectators alongside the the, the performers. So we simply cannot ignore the spectators if we think of ancient drama. 
in terms of performance. And in his uh, pi pioneering works from the late 70s, Oliver Taplin expressed a clear awareness of this methodological and scientific need. When thinking about plays in performance, he wrote, um, we must also feel the presence of the audience, not only because every sound and movement is ultimately directed at them, but also because their shared experience is part of the play as a whole. The play is so designed as to take thoughts and emotions of the audience along with it. So we are, we are today particularly interested in this last sentence, the play so designed as to take thoughts and emotions of the audience. There have been important recent publications on the sociology of Athenian and Roman theatrical spectators and how it affects our understanding of spectatorship. So along such lines as gender, age, class, geographic origin, and so on. So such as uh, Roselli's 2011 book, Theater of the People, or the contribution of James Robson, 2016, a humoring the masses, the theater audience and the highs and lows of Aristophanic comedy. But today we are equally interested in new developments on thoughts and emotions in the ancient world. And we ask whether and how they can inform our understanding of the cognitive and affective um, underpinnings of spectatorship. So for instance, we are interested in um, the history and the, the theorization of emotions and affects, um, that is the range, the physicality, the embodiedness of emotions elicited by plays, whether felt privately or collectively. <clears throat> but we also want to ask how plays elicit embodied or extended cognition or employ individu individual or collective intelligence. So how recent developments in cognitive approaches to Greek drama can refresh our understanding of um, spectatorship in line with, um, for instance, a Minex ground groundbreaking 2018 monograph, Theatrocracy, Greek Drama Cognition. <clears throat> so, and of course, this is too ambitious and we are only starting to investigate today these topics with our talks. These are difficult questions which expose us to the risk of building pure construction. So as the French scholar Nicole Leroux um, already put it in 1999, our sources, whether material or textual, are quite limited and most often indirect and scattered over very different historical periods. But I think these research questions are crucial insofar as we as 21st century spectators and scholars, we tend to base our interpretations of the place on implicit and often unquestioned uh, conceptions of what the ancient specta spectators could get, how, what they could grasp in a show, how they would react and how they would interpret such or such textual or supposed visual aspects of a play. So whether we write about allusions, so for instance, interperformative allusions, allusions to other artistic media, allusions to ritual settings or historical events, or whether we reflect on metatheatricality, or even on the political meaning of the plays, we are making inferences about the competences of the spectators, so their theatrical literacy, their political sensitivity and education, and often without questioning ourselves enough about the validity of these inferences. So, and with the word competences, I, I, my, my, I am making an allusion myself to an unavoidable notion theorized by Martin Reverman in his seminal 2006 studies on the competencies of theatrical audiences in 5th and 4th century Athens. So Reverman tried to define what he called the bottom line of expertise 
for the spectators of Aristophanes' plays. And he also introduced the very helpful concept of the stratified audience composed of elite and non-elite members. So comedies may, and I quote, appeal to all while inviting layered responses and creating strata of connoisseurship. So these concepts are still central today, but the panel aims maybe to redefine them or to develop them in new directions or, or propose new ones in light of a trans historical reflection encompassing fifth century Athens and third century Republican Rome. And we feel the reflection has been made excessively Athenocentered. So pitfall we perhaps won't avoid completely today, but um, we are lucky to have Krishna to, to have this balance between Greece and Rome. So new multidisciplinary perspectives combining philology, performance studies, cognitive humanities, but also psycholinguistics, anthropology or the history of religion may prove to be useful to enlarge our scope and to enrich our critical strategies. So I stop now and let's uh, present maybe some practical details about the, the panel protocol. Oh, you're muted, Al. No, we couldn't get past that. <laughs> well, it's about spectatorship, not audience. So the, the audio doesn't matter. No, uh, thank you, Anne Sophie, for that efficient and uh, very uh, thought inspiring summary of what we're about in this panel. I've just shared a, a new screen, which is our schedule for today. Now the SES is a rather traditional conference, but with a group of audience and performance minded scholars, we really wanna embrace the potentials of our new Zoom format. So on the traditional side of things, this seminar is going to feature three papers, roughly 25 minutes each. Um, Krishni and I will be presenting our papers live, uh, but Anne Sophie's talk is pre-recorded, but as you can see, she's very much present here. To reduce background noise and any distractions, participants who aren't active speakers will be muted by default like I just demonstrated myself. Uh, but during the Q&A, we'll ask for audio and video feedback from those who virtually raise their hands. And you can do that using the raise hand function. That's probably at the bottom of your screen. If not there, it's under the participants tab. Um, the speakers, however, all invite rolling comments using Zoom's chat function. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with the platform, there's a dialogue bubble at the bottom of the screen, and this will pull up a side panel where you can engage in the chat. Now, of course, presenters are going to be busily presenting and not engaging with the chat themselves during their talks, but moderators are going to be doing their best to uh, extract and distill recurrent themes within the chat. So please don't feel like the chat is a distraction. Uh, this is a, our way to get more input, more dialogue uh, as we are presenting. Uh, now, uh, although this is the first panel slot in the entire conference, we recognize that Zoom fatigue is real and we'll be having five minute breaks after the first two uh, papers and Q and A's. You're free to get up, use the restroom, grab a coffee, whatever you need, but we'll try to stick to the schedule printed or now visible on your screen. And then last but not least, um, I wanna make a quick note about the SES AIA's joint harassment policy. And I'll drop the link into the chat function to kind of get the chat going. Um, I don't think this will be a problem at all with our attendees, but we want to be respectful of presenters and respectful of others' thoughts. Uh, if there any problem arises, I reserve the right, and the rest of the panel does as well, to eject you. I don't think that's going to happen at all. We want parecia, we want vigorous debate, uh, and we just want that in a respectful manner. Uh, I think that sums up the technical details. And sophie Krishni, Marianne, have I missed anything? All right, then I'll turn it back to you, yeah. Anne Sophie. I think you're right, and the, the timing is perfect. Thanks, all. So, I'm delighted to introduce my precious teammates for this panel Al Duncan, who is assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So, he has mentioned his deep and continuous involvement in directions, productions, translations of performances of classical drama 
And this experience also informs his research, which focuses on the production, materiality and aesthetics of the dramas of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides and Aristophanes. Among his wide range of interests, we also find cognition, reception of classical plays, uh, especially in South Africa, and connections between performance and ped pedagogy. So we, we are also all looking forward to reading soon his in-progress book, Ugly Productions, Genre and Aesthetics in Athenian Drama, that will explore the ways ugliness established and mediated genre in the nascent art form of theater. And we can see the connection with his title today. Is Oedipus ugly? deliberative spectatorship at Colonus. Thank you so much, Anne-Sophie. And I want to reiterate your gratitude to you and the panel for pulling this all together under rather trying circumstances this year. Anne-Sophie was really the, um, the prime mover on so many things. So I'm very grateful for that generous introduction and your work throughout. I'm gonna share via the chat right now, a PDF of my handout. Imagine me or one of us distributing this at the beginning of the panel materially. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get it up onto the SCS platform, but I hope this will work. That said, if you don't need a, uh, a handout, you. I'll be presenting everything that you need to see uh, on the screen right here. So if you prefer a digital platform, a digital handout, you have it. Otherwise, I'll get started. All right, let's begin by considering some passages from the first half of the Oedipus at Colonus, which provide the most salient verbal evidence for my title, Is Oedipus Ugly? Now, this cheeky question, it won't surprise you at all to hear, is much easier to raise than it is to answer although perhaps not for the reasons that you'd expect. In a genre that shirks making much ado of personal aesthetics, Oedipus at Colonus curiously has a lot to say about its hero's appearance. And yet the, th the play throws an early curveball to its audience, a peculiar phrase which I'll be suggesting triggers processes of deliberative spectatorship, important not only to the themes of the play in particular, but also to the spectatorship of ancient drama more broadly. Now, we'll be returning to each of these passages again. So for the moment, I ask you to focus simply on the emboldened phrases, which in each case refer to Oedipus's appearance. And I'll start with the curveball. This is example A on your handouts, where an anonymous man from Colonus, uh, conventionally known as the Xenos or stranger, concludes a brief interview with Oedipus. A per per e genaios hosidonti plain to daimonos men. So since you're surely noble, at least to an observer, Hosidonti, except for your misfortune, remain here. Now compare this response uh, from the stranger to the next description of Oedipus that we have from the chorus of Colonnaeons. Yo, yo, denos menhoran, denos de cluain. Oh, oh, terrible he is to look upon and terrible to hear. Now, Fewer than 70 lines separate these two descriptions, not much more than five minutes in performance. In the intervening lines, the actor playing Oedipus, so far as we can tell, has not changed his appearance in any material way. How is the same figure then, both noble and terrible to look upon? I apologize. Um, a variety of explanations are available, especially as the semantic ranges of Ganaios and Danos are both notoriously wide. Even so, it's difficult to reconcile these descriptions fully, particularly as each is emphatically tied to the sense of sight. The playwright seems to be at pains to show how the same appearance can produce different responses among different spectators within the play. But how should spectators sitting in the theater respond to this information? As the play gets underway, it becomes increasingly clear that Oedipus's appearance is not only contested, but also dramatically significant. A consensus emerges as the chorus's first impressions are nearly echoed or corroborated by Oedipus himself, his daughter as many, and still others as the play goes on. Looking again for the moment only at the emboldened passages, uh, portions of passages C and D, we'll note not only a distinct emphasis on vision, but also a broadly negative aesthetics attached to Oedipus's person. So first, in this apology for his appearance, item number C on your handouts, 
Oedipus asks the chorus to look beyond his disfigurement. Meda mukara to dysprosopton esoron atimases, don't dishonor me seeing my face as hard to look upon. While next is Meni's initial response to seeing her father and her sister uh, is characterized by pain, difficulty. She sees them unfortunately, oh father, unfortunate to see. The question then arises almost in retrospect. Why is the Colonnean stranger's assessment with its prominent early position in the play so atypical and so generous? If it's unproductive to ask why, and it probably is, we might instead ask, what are the effects of such an inconsistent description, not only for ourselves as readers of a script who can recursively return between these passages, but also for spectators in the theater who beyond the vocal performance of these words encounter an embodied production in progressing time among a crowd of fellow spectators. That is to say, how do we solve a problem like Oedipus's appearances collectively and as a theatrical audience? This seminar was convened to highlight recent work on the spectatorship of ancient drama. And within this emergent research area, I'm suggesting that some of the more interesting aspects of ancient spectatorship may be studied in cases where, as here, verbal reports are in apparent conflict. These inconsistencies demand that theater goers not only synthesize information from the performance, but also assess and adjudicate it. Such evaluative processes are especially germane to aesthetic questions where not the what, but rather the how to see is really most crucial. But when practiced in the collective context of the theater, these assess uh, assessments also have social consequences. They're triggering collective intersubjective responses that inform spectators' collective action and identity. I'm suggesting that in Oedipus at Colonus, these early and conflicting reports over Oedipus's appearance serve a thematic and preparatory function laying the effective and social groundwork for later, more holistic assessments of Oedipus's value. In this way, a question of theatrical communication reflects and informs other deliberative political processes, which might be considered of more substantial importance, the question of going to war, etc. So this paper has three parts. First, I consider how spectators' prior knowledge, or to quote Anne-Sophie, competence, we're borrowing Reverman's terminology there, shapes their reaction to Oedipus's appearance and its descriptions. Second, I revisit our first four passages in slightly greater depth, arguing for their interconnection and importance in establishing the significance of Oedipus's appearance. Third and finally, a close inspection of the initial exchange between Oedipus and the Athenian king Theseus reveals a moment of thematic and deliberative transition. By advancing what I'm calling communicative common ground, and that's a term I'm borrowing from the linguist Herbert Clark, Theseus transforms spectators' aesthetic uncertainties into concerns over issues of broader value. Their collective deliberative spectatorship, first practiced and refined in assessing Oedipus's appearance, becomes part of a collective capacity an identity even, the social effects of which might spill over even beyond the theatrical event. So part one, spectatorial competency. Even before the first words of the play are encountered, readers and spectators alike have expectations of what Oedipus will look like. Audience expectation, an external but essential piece of information, lies at the heart of Reverman's J.H.S. article, The Competence of Theater Audiences in 5th and 4th Century Athens. To riff on Reverman's terminology, at the moment on Zoom, I'm addressing a super competent audience of SCS attendees. Those studiously familiar, not only with the broad narrative backdrop of Greek myth, but also with the historical context of 5th century Athenian theater as so-called super, super competence. You already know, for instance, that Oedipus at Colonus inhabits the narrative gap between two earlier Sophoclean tragedies, Oedipus the King and Antigone. You'll also know, however, that it's a mistake to treat these three plays as a proper trilogy, like our undergraduates always do, or even as a unified artistic whole. Even so, I wanna push back on that. The, the artistic and historical distinctions between works, which are real, shouldn't obscure the expectations that such plays raise. 
In particular, the cultural echoes of the grisly self-blinding episode in the finale of Oedipus uh, the King, which has to be one of the most visually horrific sequences in all of extant attic tragedy, would still resound even a quarter century after its initial performance. Now, as others have pointed out, even when it departs from Sophoclean precedent, Oedipus at Colonus remains in frequent dialogue with its predecessors. It's a very retrospective play. Suffice it to say then that for minimally competent fifth century Athenian audiences, however they're stratis stratified, and for many others since, the eponymous character of Oedipus at Colonus was, and you'll pardon this horrible expression, no blind date. Now, so far as I framed the idea of competence, as it might pertain uh, to an individual spectator, it's really the cultural familiarity which has important corollaries, col uh, excuse me, uh, for collective spectatorship. Not only were Athenian spectators likely to know something about the earlier Oedipus plays themselves, they could reasonably expect a significant portion of their fellow audience members to be similarly familiar. This is an intersubjective awareness about which Anne Sophie will be talking a little bit more soon. Jokes from Aristophanes' nearly contemporary frog secure that for late fifth century audiences, the unfortunate Oedipus was a core part of the tragedic canon. Now this common competence that all the audience would somewhat share allows not only for meaningful literary dialogism between the works, something that Reverman's interested in, but also for the ways that theater goers respond both collaboratively and jointly to certain aspects of the performance. Even if spectators held or expected others to hold a variety of opinions about how Oedipus looked, the mythical, theatrical, and in particular the Sophoclean history of his character renders his appearance a real salient point of interest as soon as the title is known. I, I imagine Athenians going to the Proagon, seeing the costumes displayed and thinking, how is Oedipus going to look? This is something that's important. We are at evidentiary and methodological loose ends, however, when it comes to reconstructing how the actor playing Oedipus looked as he first hobbled on the stage. Uh, regardless of the historical event, I think we should be thinking about performances fundamentally plural and manifold. Uh, we, we shouldn't distill it to one single performance. Uh, but at least we do have the play's opening lines, which will verbally set the scene, and these are included in handout item E. I print the whole first eight lines for your consideration, but in the interest of time, I'm only gonna be reading from the sections of the first and last pairs of verses. So we have, Tepnon tuflu gerontos antigone, child of a blind old man Antigone, at what country have we arrived? To, or to what city of what men? Now, establishing the character's identities, which is maybe the, the primary function of this opening line, the play's first four words, technon, tuflu, gerontos, antigone, distill the narrative essentials from the two earlier Sophoclean dramas. Beyond this interdramatic reference, in defining himself self negatively against Greek norms and ideals of youth and sightedness, Oedipus is making no pretense to possessing the blend of aesthetic and social goodness, the kalokagathia, which characterize aristocratic self-presentation in Athens. And yet, skipping down to lines seven and eight, Oedipus believes that the combination of his suffering, his age, and his nobility, what he's calling tall ganion, have profoundly shaped his being. So even without getting into the verbal and uh, particular visual details of his appearance, Oedipus's prologue subtly but programmatically establishes the tensions between suffering, nobility, and appearances that will continue to lie at the heart of this play. Now we can return to passage A up at the top of your handouts, where the Colonnade stranger, first among a series of characters, responds to Oedipus's appearance. The stranger's response is peculiar, not only in its positivity, but also for its placement. The majority of personal descriptions in Attic a tragedy occur at the moment of arrival or scenic change. But the stranger comes upon Oedipus and Antigone violating a holy sanctuary, a situation whose religious urgency compels the character to bypass the usual tragic rigmarole so that the stranger's description of Oedipus ends rather than begins his interview. As a result, his assessment is less reflective of first appearances perhaps and offers instead a more holistic assessment. Even so, this evaluation is expressly tied to vision 
as Hosedonti in the second line makes clear, a phrase that stands in curious contrast to afanes, hidden from sight, in the following line. Although syntactically parenthetical, Hosedonti's hardly gratuitous in context, expressed impersonally by an observer ostensibly as disinterested as any that we'll find in the play, theater goers have little reason to doubt this description. Fine, he's Ganaios, as he, uh, so, or so he looks. Indeed, spectators might lend special credence to the stranger's words simply because they're the first in the play to touch on Oedipus's appearance, an example of cognitive anchoring bias, which privileges initial evidence. Its position really matters here. But wherever they occur, verbal descriptions in attic trauma are doubly revealing, and I owe this idea to Krishna, conveying not only objective details about the observed, but also the subjective attitudes of the observer. The unnamed and presumably invented figure of the stranger has little authority outside of his dramatic position, and theater goers are apt to scrutinize this exchange as much for the information it provides about the stranger as a character as they do about Oedipus's looks. But given all these relevant factors then, first, spectators established mythical and theatrical competencies, the actor's important but indeterminate portrayal, Oedipus's programmatic prologue, and the stranger's initial position and partial framing, how do spectators visualize or see the character of Oedipus at this moment in the play? Is he ugly? Whose vision should spectators trust? We're at a real quandary here. But don't worry, an entire cavalry of Cullinan eyes is coming. Informed by the stranger's report, the chorus arrives to look for foreigners who violated the sanctuary. Their paradox song places special emphasis on vision, and while it's not unusual for entering choruses to be involved in some sort of search, think about Akarnians, etc., after the stranger's peculiar assessment, the chorus's vision has become particularly salient. Vision matters, their vision matters. Although these aged vigilantes are less dispassionate than the stranger, they nevertheless have the visual authority of, of a collective entity. They've got lots of sets of eyes and they're comprised no less of Greek male citizens, which is a remarkable thing in Attic tragedy. Their collective response to seeing Oedipus, and this is again item B in your handouts, I won't be dramatic and read it again, we can't dismiss it out of hand. Even as the apexegetic Horan links their observation to vision, the parallel phrase, denos akuen, highlights the chorus's multi-sensory, almost synesthetic response to Oedipus's presence. Denos, like kakos, is a hypernym that's frequently used in Greek tragedy at the blurred intersection of ethics, aesthetics, and circumstance. He's terrible in a lot of ways. Is ugliness part of that? Although denos is not necessarily pejorative, or even what modern theory would consider narrowly aesthetic in its application, in this context, it's difficult to interpret the word as applying favorably to Oedipus's looks. <laughs> if you take this input and are applying it to your emergent idea of what Oedipus looks like, Danos isn't doing him any favors. <laughs> Indeed, commenters on this passage from ancient scolius up to those of the last century have been at pains to specify or account for this peculiar expression. It catches everyone off guard. So regardless of what the chorus or Sophocles for that matter means with this phrase, spectators and scholars alike have been left to reconcile these difficult and contradictory, maybe even just puzzling accounts. Now, another voice with special authority soon weighs in on the issue and that's naturally of Oedipus himself. Oedipus exhorts the chorus to receive him kindly, apologizing for his appearance. We're back to item C on the handout. The defensive framing here echoes Oedipus's earlier words, lines 49 and 50, which I don't include here, that the stranger not dishonor him, again, timae, or timao is significant, because Oedipus at that point is a vagabond, aletes, a kind of category like geron or tuflos uh, that has a cultural identity with negative aesthetic associations. But for all this, you'll no doubt have noticed that once again, an adjective is matched with a verb, in this case, a participle, esoron, of seeing. The descriptor here is not, it is not so broad as ganaios or deinos, but is disprosopon, hard to look upon. Now, this is a rare term, and it highlights the visual faculty, as it also calls to mind its cognate, prosopon, the word not only for face, of course, but also the vox propria for the dramatic mask in the fifth century. 
So Oedipus recognizes himself not simply as hard to look upon, but somehow bad-faced, or maybe more metatheatrically, poorly masked. We have a real sense of his visual ugliness here. We're, we're gathering consensus as the evidence comes forward. Now, Oedipus's words are echoed moments later when his many arrives and greets her father and sister with the words printed in item D. Sweetly do I pronounce the two names of my father and sister, how after having a hard time finding you, it is with additional pain that I have a hard time looking upon you. The, the English falls very flat, I apologize. Oh child, have you come? Oh father, unfortunate to see. So again, we have an apexegetic infinitive, horon, serving as almost a syntactic flag uh, for what's become a concatenation of evidence pertinent to Oedipus's appearance. Again, vision and negative aesthetics are being developed, except for Ganiles. And as in passage C, the dis prefix here links the hero's uh, appearances with his misfortunes. But just as we were noticing that dramatic vision tends to look both ways, the ill fortune, as many mentions, uh, is at once her family's and her own. And the pain and difficulty that she experiences, the lupe, the mollus, looking at her father is linked to her own perception, lepo. Ismeni's reaction calls our attention to a reflexive relationship that's always present between perception and emotion and affect, between aesthetics and affect, that's being repeatedly drawn in the play. So Danos isn't simple. It's not simply that Oedipus is ugly, but we're, we're getting to that point. We are theorizing his appearances as we attend the play. Now, we're moving at the next part to part three, I guess, where, where Theseus is establishing common ground. I'll take a quick sip. Theseus arrives on the scene and is remarkable in the way that he interacts with Oedipus. This is item F on your handouts. Having heard many times in the past, Paul on Akuon, about the bloody destruction of your eyes, I recognize you, son of Laios, and now looking upon you after this journey, I know you all the more. For both your clothing, Skewe, and your wretched head make clear to me who you are. And out of pity for you, I want to ask, unlucky Oedipus, and then he goes on. Theseus's reaction and his position make him a particularly credible viewer, one whose subjective position has many affinities with those of the Attic spectators. He contrasts his own knowledge, which is based upon past visual or verbal report, the Paulon Akuon Egnokasa, uh, with that which is anchored to his present vision, Leuson Malon Exepistamai. In his speech, we see the popularity of the tragic character finding a fictional analog within the frame of, uh, or within the frame of the um, drama being the fame of Oedipus's suffering. Theseus, like the play's competent spectators, has established expectations of Oedipus's appearance. He's offering a highly diplomatic address. So Theseus avoids using subjective visual or aesthetic descriptions. He doesn't call him ugly to his face. And yet for the first time in the play, Theseus is giving a positive and detailed description of the cause of Oedipus's ugliness. We get this in tas haimateras omaton diaphthoras, which is a particularly vivid verse in line with the grisly descriptions from the end of the OT. Now, reference to both Oedipus's clothing, his skewe, which is also the technical term for theatrical costume, and head, or person, since kara can mean both, paint a rather complete picture. Oedipus complements uh, Theseus's summary in the next passage, so this is G on your handouts, noting that it leaves him with little to say other than to state his business, which he does in the following. I come to present my wretched body to you. Tumon Athlion Demos, a gift not much to look at, Uspudaiones Opsen, but the benefits from it are greater than a handsome appearance, a Morphe Kale. To talk of a beautiful form like Morphe Kale with reference to one's body, Demos, is about as explicit as Greek can ever be about personal aesthetics. This is very narrow. Together with Theseus's positive account of Oedipus's self-blinding, this would seem to settle once and for all the question of whether Oedipus is ugly. He says it himself. But these lines present a crucial pivot in the play. 
as personal appearance, morphe here, is compared to a vaguely defined notion of kerodos, profit or benefit, the full details of which Oedipus is not yet willing to divulge. He's very cagey about this. This is neither the first nor the last time that Oedipus claims his body brings benefit. Uh, we might compare the Onesis back in uh, passage C here. But it's a moment of theatrical and deliberative transference. As soon as Oedipus's ugly appearance is pinned down, settled by his own authority and that of Theseus's important subjectivity, which mirrors and models the audiences, a new but related question is pushed into the fore. What kind of man is Oedipus? Not what does he look like, but what kind of man is he? And what benefit can he provide Athens? Now, Theseus's role in the play is probably impossibly ideal. He's a proto-democratic Athenian king, and he's been much discussed. But I take it as an underappreciated aspect of his intervention in the play uh, that Theseus establishes what Clark calls common ground with respect to the crucial issues of the narrative. So let me go back to Theseus's uh, words here. Um, common ground is the established um, mutually recognized facts and symbols upon which communication is practically advanced. Communication fails miserably without the establishment of certain things of common ground. Now, it's established naturally and seemingly automatically in daily conversation. Clark takes as his example a grocery store checkout encounter. But like so much of language and communication, when one starts to look under the cover, common grounds dynamics become dizzyingly complex and its employment by uh, speakers becomes highly sophisticated. Theseus's speech, which is up on your screens, offers crucial context for understanding Oedipus's appearance, introducing objective facts into our communication and connecting the present figure with his legend. For spectators, he's linking their own cultural competencies about the figure with that of the present production. We're mapping myth onto the stage aesthetically. His remarkable political acumen, Theseus is, is, and his authority derived not simply from his moral virtues in the play, but from his communicative abilities, his power to synthesize and scrutinize evidence. Theseus isn't just Athens' commander in chief, he's the communicator in chief as well, to riff on what uh, H, uh, George W. Bush had said many years ago. All right, let's talk about theater and common ground. Theseus does more than any other character in the play to establish common ground, but he's not alone in engaging in this endeavor. The spectators themselves, as silent but social participants in theatrical communication, have been reacting to every step of the performance as they grappled with a particularly elusive but significant aesthetic question, that of Oedipus's appearance. Their deliberations were um, challenged uh, at least one time, but they were also incomplete, made up of seemingly incommensurate information. Um, but they were also extreme in their subjectivity and semiotic fluidity. Ugliness is hard to pin down. This is an unanswerable question, almost, until Oedipus answers it for us. Spectators at Col Colonus had little common ground to stand upon. It's a disorienting condition, and one with which theater goers are remarkably familiar, since we're constantly and cre creatively working through a fluid and provisional understanding of performance. We never have the whole picture at first. Theater might be thought of as an exercise in establishing sequentially communicative common ground. So it's in this context that spectatorship, in a kind of narrow sense of the active visual participation of the work, is exemplary of the entire theatrical experience. Fundamentally, theatrical spectatorship must account for a variety of perspectives, as play internal vision is inevitably subjective. Context, too, is always crucial, and we learn to expect evolving responses from characters, as is the case with the stranger and then the chorus as they react differently to Oedipus over time. Now, theat theatrical spectatorship demands handling all these ambivalencies, uh, since appearances can be in the theater at once meaningful, but also deceiving. It's very hard to parse these things apart. But above all, I'm suggesting theatrical spectatorship is collective. Seeing in the Greek theater is a manifestly shared experience in which spectators are engaging in joint attention. Now, joint attention and joint action are closely entwined. 
And even if they're silent, the audience is developing continuously as a collective organ. The experience that they have in the theater of Dionysus is not that far different from what they have at the nearby Pnyx, the location of the assembly, where they're quietly, but with an awareness of themselves, assessing points, counterpoints, and offering a collective judgment. Theseus's role here then, although it's singular and scripted, has um, a real democratic and distributed nature. He's an internal prism within the play, establishing the common ground necessary for the spectators to watch. Now, to wrap up, what can we learn about deliberation from Oedipus at Colonus and its aesthetic and ethical training? Well, I think back to the initial stranger. It's important that we suspend initial judgment. It's important that we look at a collection of evidence and perspectives and assess those jointly. We want to state facts clearly and unambiguously, manifestly establishing a common ground. And as we learn from Theseus's application of democratic principles, we want to see and hear even that which is distasteful. The ugly has a space in the city and we shouldn't turn our collection, collective attention away from some of the more unsavory aspects of our visual experience. So while I marked the stranger's initial vision as aberrant, I ultimately think it offers a deeper insight into how we as spectators, not only of ancient Greek theater, but of our own political life, should react deliberatively and collectively to things that are very ugly in the present. Thank you very much. Thanks very much oh, <clears throat> for these very engaging papers. So we have um, nine minutes for discussion before the first break. Thanks everyone. So we have Matthew, um, so I don't know, I don't know if I can do that all to unmute the... I, I think we can unmute speech. ourselves. <laughs> okay, that's, so that's great. Yeah. Um, Thank thanks so much, Elle. Um, this talk was really engaging. Um, I'm, I'm really um, struck by thinking through the way um, Oedipus, who I've always, I guess, just kind of assumed is sort of horrible looking in this play, like his appearance is actually complicated and ambivalent in really interesting ways. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about the conventions of masked theater. Um, I mean, I, I'm really struck and persuaded by your reading of, um, I think it's handout C, um, these lines, kara dus uh, prosopton, the, conjuring up the idea of the prosopon, the mask. Um, and I, I'm thinking about um, the way uh, masked theater, performers in masked theater are able to conjure up different facial expressions using a mask that doesn't actually change. Um, and this is a, a thing that we observe in no theater and other, other mass theatrical traditions that a gifted performer can do that. But I think in the Greek theater, it's, it's clear that another way of doing that is to have characters um, say, you're giving me a dirty look or you're, um, you know, uh, look at the grin on your face or whatever. And the audience, I mean, if you've ever been in the, you know, audience, been an audience member in a mass performance, you know that you see the mask change even when you know it's not really changing. So I'm wondering if you could um, think through that with me a little bit. I, do you think um, some of the ambivalence in, in Oedipus's performance could be tied to the way a, a competent audience reacts to changes in the, the facial expression of a mask? The short answer is absolutely. And that's a great question, Matthew. Uh, I'm In my Zoom screen, I'm right above Amy Cohen. So we've got the uh, the masked practitioner and expert in the room. Uh, we don't have Peter Beinick in the room as far as I know, uh, but his work uh, obviously on the cognition of the mask and how it can transform seemingly before our very eyes is important. Uh, for some of this, I would also pivot to Anne-Sophie's recent work on the kind of multi-sensory inputs uh, that shape our cognitive experience. It's always about the visual aspect of the mask. But you're highlighting something that's metatheatrical and very interesting, which is that his mask doesn't change. Uh, that we have one that if there's one constant throughout this, that there's a lot of development sequentially as the play goes on, but his face has always been there. Now, in the, my bibliography, I mentioned Josh Beer's book on Oedipus, which is pretty good, but uh, it's peculiar. One of the things that he offers is that nobody has seen Oedipus's face frontally until the chorus's reaction. It's a coup de théâtre that somehow this has been hidden. And this is somewhat echoes what Jeb says on this point that uh, the chorus is so 
uh, crass because they haven't yet had the time. I forget his Victorian, you know, phrasing, but like to discern the lineage or line, something to discern the suffering on his face that that would somehow temper their response to this horrific image. But yes, I think at a cognitive level, we have to assume that the mask changes in its perception over time. Materially, no, I, I don't think he's going backstage and uh, you know, doing a quick sw switch in the Grove. Uh, but meaningfully, we're guided through that. And that does have metatheatrical and uh, maybe moral uh, implications as well. That, that's great, thank you. Thank you, Al. Yeah. So I think Rosa um, had a question and Amy too. Uh, thank you so much. I enjoyed that. Um, I have a specific question about passage B. I'm interested yes. when um, you, and you drew attention to the fact that you have um, sight and hearing um, here. But I'm, I mean, obviously, you know, we're all, as you said, we're all sort of a very specific audience. We're all highly competent. Um, and I, I can't help it. I mean, obviously, this, this that passage makes me think of the chorus's immediate reaction upon seeing Oedipus back, you know, way back in the day in Oedipus Rex, um, where, you know, Danon is repeated multiple times. Yes. Yes. And you also have, um, you know, sort of a lot of emphasis also on sound. I mean, I think also interestingly when Oedipus himself, you know, sort of, he, yeah, he's in lyric anapest, the chorus is sort of in these recited anapests, and he is also talking about, you know, the heights of his voice. Um, and just generally the chorus, I mean, I think when they also speak in Trimeter, they also draw attention to the fact that Oedipus himself is someone who is, you know, he's not to be heard or looked upon. So you have these things um, sort of appearing there. And so to me, obviously, you know, this makes me think of that passage. But of course, um, I'm generally interested in what you have to say about the implications of, I guess, these connections to the ancient audience. Um, you know, is it possible for them to have recognized um, these sort of minute things, you know, whatever, 25 years later, you know, <laughs> 25 yeah. years later or whatever. So I'd love to just hear generally on the connections to the Oedipus Rex, because I do think they're there. Um, and then just generally what we, yeah, what that implies for the audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rosa. That's you're highlighting things that I really wanted to get in, although you're bringing more nuance and finesse to it than I think I would have. Uh, but the idea that Danos is really a linking word throughout the uh, OT and OC. And just as we're saying with a kind of constant mask, the, the semiotics of this word shift over the experience, right? I mean, we also have Danos and Sophocles and the Ode to Man. Uh, what we've got here though, is a deep and abiding conflation of visual and aural perception meaning. It's hard to see how Oedipus could ever be ugly to hear in a, in a certain way. I think it's his, his eloquence, the power that he projects in his voice is peculiar. I'm haunted a bit by, and very puzzled by this initial choral reaction. As you're saying, it's highly lyrical, it's emotive, there's a lot going on, the staging isn't very clear. Um, it's clearly designed to really engage the audience on this point at this moment, uh, but how it does it, <laughs> I, I'm still uh, scratching my head on, frankly. But it's part of the process and it's part of the way that we're changing our expectations. A after this moment, I I'm po positing that the real pivot is Theseus and Oedipus's interchange about a third of the way through the play. But really we have the prologue where we have an intimate encounter with the stranger. And then as soon as we have the paradox and we have the rest of the play, we have a chorally mediated Oedipus and he's ugly, or, or at least he's Danos. Uh, I think he's ugly. Did, did that cover it enough, Rosa? Yeah, thank you. I just also want to draw attention to the fact that in the Oedipus Rex also, when the chorus says that they themselves can't, you know, they can't bear to look upon him. We also have a scolias who talks about a potential moment of stage action. They think that the chorus turns away. Um, yes. so, I, <laughs> so it's all very interesting, but yeah, thank you. Naomi's got this uh, exciting paper coming up at some point. I forget when it is, Naomi, uh, on the phenomenology of some of these things. Um, it's at a conference. I, I'm so blind. I, I'm in a blur of COVID right now, but uh, I, I'm excited to have approaches to the phenomenology of these things. It's definitely beyond OC. And as you're saying, Rosa, that the, final, the finale of OT is just incredible. 
I'm so, taking too long to respond. There are too yeah, many. So I don't know if Naomi, you want to jump in? Oh, sure. I think, although I think Amy was ahead of me. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, and I guess this is drawing from what you just alluded to, Al, I, I, I've recently been thinking of um, this, the construction of space um, at the beginning of this play. Um, and how that is quite destabilized in terms of spectatorship um, that we don't act, they're constantly raising the question of where are we in this play. So I wonder to what extent you can tie that to this sort of process of um, constructing but also destabilizing how we are to see Oedipus that you've been showing, you know, it seems like, okay, this is the Oedipus from the OT, he's, he's Danos both mm. to see and hear, but then it becomes more Complicated. Do you think that's part of a, uh, a, a sort of whole uh, process that Sophocles is in is um, is investigating here of, of um, making spectatorship more complicated? Yes, in, in short, and I think it's all very much anchored to materiality and space in the performance. That this is the the cognitive material anchor that we need to be able to embrace these kind of complex uh, incommensurate thought worlds that we're experiencing a much richer sense of space because of these physical anchors which give some clarity continuity uh, than we could be in something that was a purely verbal or, or at least non-bodily mimetic art form. Uh, so I think uh, back to Matthew's point on the mask being somewhat constant, Obviously, it actually wasn't that difficult to manage Oedipus on the stage. You could point to him constantly and know where he was. I mean, they could, we can't, that's why we fight over these things. Uh, but where that space, what that meant, what was the grove, where were its boundaries, how is this related to Athens? Um, all of those are highly relevant and very destabilized. I think it's, the more I look into the cognition of theatrical spectatorship, the more I'm amazed that it can happen. And my six-year-old can do it. It's not hard, uh, but it's, it's remarkable. So thank you. I'm sorry. I think we are running out of time for the other questions, but please um, just keep your questions for the final discussion. You can also write them down in the chat if you want. Um, there, are also, there are also some reactions uh, on the chat. So maybe we have time to look at that uh, later and we can discuss this further in the final discussion. So break, three minutes break. <laughs> and uh, Great. So we'll see you all soon. Thank you all very, soon. very much. Thank you, Matt. thank you. Oh, gosh, <laughs> that was a great first talk. Um, so should I start to share my screen now, Al? I, I think we can use this break time as technical time, yes. yes. Um, I have mine ready to go as well. So if, I don't think anything will happen, but if anything does, I'll be able to start from exactly where you leave off. Okay. First I do that. I'll stop my screen share though. I think only one of us should do that at a moment. Well, I liked your talk so much. I really appreciate this about this panel. Everything here is interesting and totally convincing. <laughs> but as Anne Sophie says, just scratching the surface, uh, we're <laughs> It, it, it's convincing that it's interesting and important uh, how it all actually works and what the limitations of these things are, both what was really happening, but then the, the methodologies that we face is fascinating. Okay, so maybe I'll just skip the, the first six seconds. <laughs> So, excellent. So anyone who's listening at home, we're gonna give this another minute and a half uh, for break and then we will start on schedule uh, at 10 central.
So I'll, I'll let you introduce myself and I just click on the play <laughs> when it's uh, tiny. Fantastic. Oh. 30 more seconds, everyone. <laughs> We can't flicker the lights like you might in a performance. I'm getting now to the chat. These are excellent questions. I'll try to respond to them yeah. at some point. All right, I think it's now time to resume. Uh, so it's, as you already all know, it's my distinct pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce my co-organizer, Anne-Sophie Noel, who is maîtresse de conférence, uh, what we in the United States might call an associate professor in Greek at the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon in France. Dr. Noel's research is especially concerned with theatrical objects, cognition, and the theories that support their mutual study. Among her bevy of recent articles, and I mean that, uh, attendees of the seminar might be particularly interested in what do we actually see on stage, a cognitive approach to the interaction of visual and aural effects in the performance of Greek tragedy. That's part of Meinick, Short, and Devereaux's Classics in Cognitive Theory, published by Rutledge in 2019, as well as Thinking Through Things, Extended Cognition as Consolatory Fiction in Greek Tragedy, which is part of a forthcoming volume from Oxford University Press, edited by Felix Budelman and Ina Schleider, Minds on Stage. Now, giving us a much needed break from tragedy as we begin 2021, Dr. Noel today will be guiding us through the world of comedy in her paper, Performing Deep Intersubjectivity, Emancipated Spectators in Aristophanes Ecclesia Zeusai. Uh, go ahead and start the video, Anne Sophie. Oh, I most radiant of the Wilborn lamp, superb invention of sagacious men. It is dumb, and Praxagora enters carrying a lamp addressed as an eye, a clear metaphor of vision, lamp from Omar, and again of Talmud, line 13. Aristophanes' Ecclesia Tusai was indeed the first comedy to be performed at the opening of the comic competition in the city Dionysia of around 391 BC. So the prologue plays on the concomitance between the early hour in the plot and in the real life of the actors and the spectators who have just taken place in the theatre. The lamp may be interpreted as the first material symbol offered to an assembly of spectators as a mirroring image of their own activity in the theatrum, as theatai or theomenoi, they are gathered to watch Theomai a play. After this first focalization of vision on vision, Praxagora later on frames the goal of her actions in these terms. So teaching the theatre to learn new things and new competencies. As Niall Slater therefore put it, um, more than most plays, the Ecclesiat Society negotiates the conditions of its own reception with its audience. In this talk, I would like to revisit this proposition with new tools, combining performance studies with the concept of deep and subjectivity borrowed from George Spute's narrative theory. In I Know That You Know That I Know, the author argues indeed that 18th and 19th century British novels invented multi-layered representation of consciousness, or as Lyda Sunshine puts it, mutually reflecting subjectivity. However, already in Aristophanes' play, I argue we can find dramatic situations with multi-layered representation of consciousness which includes the point of view of the spectators. These are invited to perceive the reaction of a character to a first character's mental state. This phenomenon is articulated, I suggest, with a consideration of the spectator's status and theatrical literacy. The external audience 
as a diverse body of subgroups from privileged to low backgrounds is encouraged as a whole through watching the internal non-elite spectators' shortcomings to outperform their limited competencies. The idea of a stratified audience in terms of theatrical competencies has been convincingly developed by Martin Reverman. That's in his uh, Reverman's article of 2006. In looking at intersubjectivity in assembly women, a notably uh, complex cognitive task, I'd like to show that this stratification of the audience is not only given a static and pre-existing data depending on the spectator's civic status, education, age or experience. It's a dynamic process of horizontal stratification which is induced between the external and the internal audience. Last but not least, I would like to refine our understanding of Aristophanes' integration of a mean built teaching about the poetics of spectating. The, the audience is not supposed to adhere in a servile way to Praxagora's logic. The inbuilt training, I will argue, leaves space for debate, for ambiguity and emancipation. So let's begin by looking at the prologue, which sets up the interplay between the external and the internal audience. The actresses are trained by Praxagora, but the spectators too, as if the play integrated at its outset, its own module, training module. In this prologue, everything happens as if the audience were attending a rehearsal before the real performance starts. There is no proper paradox. Choral songs, so women enter on stage individually and in small groups from different places without singing. They hold their costumes and their props like fake birds in their hands, but haven't put them on yet. Um, the scene is interestingly reminiscent of vast painting representations that show theatrical casts before the performance has started. So you can see that on the famous Pronomos vase or on this pelique <coughs> from the, the Boston MFA. So they are rehearsing, I go back to this slide, and during this rehearsal, Praxagora acts as a stage director, while the other women sit down just as the citizens who in the coil of the peaks would have sat on the rocks or on the ground. And when the other women perform, she also becomes a judging spectator who directs the audience attention to the visual and verbal signs that must be noticed and interpreted, whether costumes and props, or language or gesture. And the comic effects recurrently consist in the female failure in blending actors and character self. So this actor-character integration or blend has been analyzed in cognitive, in cognitive terms by Bruce McConaughey, but this coalescence between actor and character was already suggested in ancient source, for instance, um, in the in the vase on the vases, when we can see mask as a second skin, and this has been um, theorized by Aristophanes in the Acharnians, for instance, and the Thesmophoria to say. So there is no melting between the actresses and the characters, but they improve. Praxagora nevertheless succeed in teaching her mates how to improve um, as an actor and her pedagogy is based on imitation. As you can read here, she has learned herself by listening to the orators. And here we can see that the first woman improves, so now that's the right way to praise the speaker and we can see also how swiftly Praxagora manages to, to switch from her role of didascale to her fictional role of orator in the rehearsal. So, my second point now for the, this prologue is that the spectator's training also allows to 
them to distance themselves from Praxagora point of view. So I want to show you two quick example. So first, Praxagora herself commits the same kind of slippage as her fellow actresses. So here she uses the word galim instead, so the, the ferret instead of the piglet, which was brought for the purif purification sacrifice at the opening of the assembly. So she doesn't find the right word because the, the ferret is the animal associated with the dom domestic space. Um, and then another example, so she, in her developed Ospercai Pro 2 stems, which celebrates female conservatism, her paradoxical praise of women rekindles traditional misogynistic stereotypes. As you can read here, they keep lovers in the house, just like in, in, the, in the old days. So this actually should detract men from giving them any public power. But at the same time, spectators may wonder whether this could be a shrewd strategy to please a male audience by comforting their prejudices against women. But the spectator training received helps to create a collective focused attention um, on some significant aspects of the performance. Yet the scope of the external audience is always wider than that of the internal one. So the spectators can evaluate Praxagora as a teacher and as a narrator, which makes of them emancipated spectators who create themselves themselves their own reception of the play. And I'm borrowing here a concept by um, the philosopher and theorist of theatre Jacques Rancière in his 2008 essay, so Le Spectateur Emancipé, so the Emancipated Spectators. Teaching them does not erase potential debates of interpretation. So let's look now at how this works in what has been labeled as the second prologue of the play. So the women exits after the rehearsal, singing a choral ode that has been interpreted as a reversed Barados song, an exit rather than an entrance song. So they leave the theater to go to the Pnyx, to the Ecclesia, just a mile further. And this reversed song can grant the audience an increased consciousness that a parallel action, and here actually the main action, is happening in the off-stage space. And at the same time, this invisible space of the assembly is extraordinarily familiar to them and also replicates the theatrical venue in many regards, as has been shown by many scholars. The Im imaginative task of the spectators is thus facilitated by the many lived connections they were able to, to experience themselves on a regular basis between the theater and the assembly. And shortly after this exit, the theater, which is then downgraded to an off-stage space becomes, among other things, the setting for a scene about the observation of observations. And that's a phrasing from uh, George Pute, again, his book, his 2004 book. So the external audience can observe Cremise as a spectator. Um, Cremise himself has observed the women's show. So the displacements of the assembly thus allows for deeply focalizing um, on the process of spectating itself. And the spectators themselves are characterized. So we have Krimis, the neighbor of Praxagora, and the other male citizen he represents, and they are described in a derogatory, derogatory way. Um, let me show you this. So they are frivolous, they are greedy, they come to the Ecclesia for an entertainment. So for instance, the red vermilion rope gives them a good laugh, and they come for the pay. And the spectator's gaze also encompasses pleperous reactions and indirect appreciation of the narrative. 
Piperos himself is a frustrated spectator, literally constipated and unable to wake up to wake up early enough to attend the assembly. He ignores the assembly's agenda and he is negatively portrayed as mainly interested in uh, receiving the three old balls rather than taking an active part in the democratic processes. So his constipation is an evident political metaphor. So let's look at Krimi's competencies as a spectator. He's, he's taken in the women's performance, so he exemplifies the male collective delusion in front of the female show. So for instance, he, mis he misinterprets the unusual crowd of people with white faces, so the women. He identified them with a troupe of shoemakers, so white and pale workers because they work inside. Um, then he sees in Praxagora an elegant young man from an aristocratic background. So um, he compares her to Nikias, so maybe the, the famous grandson of the, the grandson of the famous general. And his comments also mirror the dysfunctional aspects of the democratic assembly. Like the other men attending the assembly, he is unable to respond to the criticism addressed to them by um, this new, this young new orator who speaks in favor of women. So if women, for instance, don't become sycophants, if they don't subvert the democratic rules, it is just because they are excluded from the political life as a whole. But um, the men are not able to formulate this uh, response. And this incompetence is reinforced by the comments of the indi indirect spectators of Epirus, who agrees with the accusations brought against him and against men in general. So the play internal may spectate spectators just buy the show and passively accepts the coup staged by the women as shoemakers. Um, so as you can see here, the political transition is decreed without much discussion. So that's actually been decreed, that's Papyrus. Yes, it has. However, the lesson of the second prologue does not end here. The process of spectating is reflected as a multi-layered act of judgment. So it's not only that Cremes and Papyrus are bad male spectators of a good female show. The observation of the observations encourages the viewers to demystify men and women alike. They can recognize men's credulity and failure to unmask the women while also identifying errors in women's thinking and behavior that could and maybe that should have jeopardized the success of their political enterprise. So, first example, the female appearance itself, it's not the one which was sought after. Krimis sees them as young and pale shoemakers, so which is wrong. But the external spectators know from the prologue that the women actually wanted to be sentenced and to resemble respectable old men from the country. So when they go out, they sing an old man song imitating the way country people act. So why so? Probably because all men from the country are easier to impersonate and they also attend the, the assembly less often. And second, in Praxagora's speech, um, line 435 suggests that she uses an argumentum ad hominem, attacking her own husband, Lepiros. So saying a great deal in praise of women and a great deal in condemnation of you, say de pola caca. The Pyrrhus asks twice, only me, M. Monon, which is indeed the question. So I wouldn't be as confident as Zonestin, who comments on these lines and 
constructs this personal designation, C, as a general one, so you as a typical male. I think the repeated questions of Pliperus suggest precisely that there is an ambiguous phrasing. At least two interpretations are possible. So I think it's possible that Praxagora is here um, committing a slippage, which would be in line with what has been witnessed before during the rehearsal of the women. She goes out of her role, she confuses private and public matter, so she speaks here as the wife, Praxagora, and not as a male political leader anymore. Or maybe she could be imitating the male and productive practice of attacks at dominum rather than making constructive political propositions. But at the same time, Blepieros, he, he's a non-elite citizen, he's not a public figure that could be targeted by personal attacks. So I would tend to think that Crimis correctly, although unwillingly, spotlights here some weak points in the women's physical and rhetorical preparation. The speech of Praxagora, Eika, Shoemaker, actually contains many sophisms and incoherences. And moreover, the description of the political transition makes clear that the citizen would have voted for the gynecocratic regime, even if the young pale face orator had been a total failure. So the decision was taken because this only hadn't ever been done before in Athens. And because according to an old saying, so all the stupid or foolish decisions we make, all of them turn out to be to our benefits in the end. So I'm coming to the last section of my talk. So there is a debate between scholars about how to understand the success of Praxagora and the subsequent instauration of the genicocratic regime. The ironic interpretation has been dominant in Europe, at least since Filanovic, that's Niall Slater who, who writes that, whereas Slater himself, but also David Constant and Matthew Dillon in the um, 1981 um, yes, uh, article, among others, are more inclined to celebrate a positive success, a triumph of comic energy. So how to revisit this debate in light of the spectatorial, cognitive and hermeneutic task analyzed so far. So the external audience is trained in the first prologue, especially to pay a particular attention to the gaps between appearances and reality, between the actor's body and the character's body, between the words and the deeds. In this first prologue, they may also become aware that they can both identify with and distance themselves from the teacher, Praxagora. They can be emancipated spectators. In the second prologue, so they can build on this to reflect on how Cremis and the male community he epitomizes makes false assumptions about women who themselves make false assumptions about what it is to act and to speak in a clever and politically efficient way. So this is a complex cognitive task with two different, two different mental states embedded. And Praxagora's mental states as perceived through Crimi's narrative is the more difficult to reconstruct. Ambiguity persists regarding what she exactly says and what motivates her speech. So for instance, when she lays charges against you, against the sea. The stratification can thus be redefined, I argue, as a dynamic process that connects together the external and the internal audience, but which also differentiates them. Kremis and Blepiros are main non-elite citizens who have assumed positions of power in the city, especially by serving on the council. Many citizens older than 30 would have had this experience of acting as bulletai 
in the course of their life and could identify with them. The Bulotte were granted prohetria in the theater. They had a designated section of their own. They are often alluded to in Aristophanes' plays. At the same time, Kremis and Blepera's spectatorial and political deficiencies are made self-evident. So the stratification is the bridge settled between external and internal spectators, which, which does not equalize them, but which invites the external audience as a whole to outperform the internal one. This setup might arouse new forms of segmentation among the spectators. So I think most, if not all of them, could possibly catch the inadequacy of Kremis' response to the women's performance. This would be prob probably the, the largest subgroup among the spectators. They would perceive the criticism of the male lack of political competencies and maybe question themselves about their own attitude, both as um, at the theater and at the ecclesia. Another subgroup, probably less numerous, could also catch the second level of embedded mental state. They would also see through, through Kremis' comments the equally inadequate rhetorical and political positioning of the, of the women. So there could be a comic um, enhancement because they can laugh at the expense of men and women alike. And they moreover could catch the irony of this double demystification for the global political interpretation of the play. So I conclude, when scholars interpret the comic viewing experience as a shared and unified response, I'm quoting this later, um, they usually base this judgment of on an interpretation of humor and jokes that can be grasped by a whole community, if not at the same level for all, for all as Riverman has shown. But intellectual sophistication is more often associated with division or segmentation in the Aristophanic audience. In Ecclesiastes' side, the focalization on spectating, the setup of deep intersubjectivity, and the spectatorial emancipation it implies, as I have argued, are on the side of intellectual and cognitive sophistication. So tadexia, the refined stuff, as mentioned in Frogs. But they seem to be designed at the same time as an inclusive, if challenging form of complexity that is addressed not only to wealthy, educated citizens, as long as they're not as blind and incoherent as Crimis, Non-elite spectators can question themselves on their viewing practices, learn not to be deluded by the tricks of the theatrical and political show, and to embrace irony, debate, and ambiguity as an increased source of enjoyment for comedy. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Anne-Sophie. Yes, I see the growing crowd and, and a growing crowd of applause too. Um, obviously intelligent spectators here are seeing what you're uh, about. I'm gonna be happy to moderate this. So I, as the claps die down, the hands can start going up on your Zoom platform uh, so we can direct questions to Anne-Sophie. I would also re remind everyone that the chat box is available. Uh, that's a great way to get things inputted as, as they're coming to your mind. Krishni. I promised myself I would give everybody else a chance to ask questions first. <laughs> But, uh, and Sophie, I just love this paper. Um, it's such a really fascinating layered look at this interesting passage. Um, I have many, many questions, uh, but let me, I guess, pick one. Um, something that really struck me this time around listening to your reading of the paper is kind of anew how important a mechanism is, uh, that how important comedy is as a mechanism for training democratic citizens in a democratic society. Because um, the joke is clearly 
most obviously on uh, Cremes and Lepros and the men who are taken in by this terrible, poor de demagogue. So I feel like the joke is really, you guys know these folks who are uneducated citizens who are really easy to manipulate. Don't be that guy, whatever you do. So I'm kind of interested in this, not just as a mechanism to uh, educate the audience, to uh, increase audience competence within a theatrical uh, setting, but also within the larger structure of the Demokratia. Mm. Yes, and I think the fact that um, there is this merging between the ecclesia and the theater, which is very strong in this play, I think it's very tempting to, to, to think together the spectatorial competencies and the democratic competencies, the, 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 um, the political competencies. They seem to be very much, um, yeah, it's just the same. And just as Leperos and Kremis are, are very bad spectators, they're also very bad uh, citizens. Um, um, there is a, a passage where Blypiros uh, says uh, there is this metaphor of constipation and he's, he says, I don't want to be a shitpot from comedy. So there is a very interesting play with the, um, with the props of comedy. And the, it's, it's metatheatrical, but it's, he's, he's in fact a shitpot citizen who is responsible for, for blocking the democratic process. And I think that's something that's um, that's that we can read in the play so yeah and you you say they were they are uneducated and i was wondering really um yes they're you know they they are obviously not very good spectators but how can we relate that to their education um but yes i think um, at least the the, the play is like a training both for the, the spectatorial competencies and the, the political ones. I uh, don't know how to raise my hand embarrassingly enough on, <laughs> on the Zoom platform, but um, I encourage others to do so. Again, weigh in on the chat, but I, I'm gonna take this opportunity, Anne Sophie, if I can, uh, to maybe extend some of this discussion beyond Ecclesia Zeusai. I think you've done a remarkable job in isolating a continuous sustained blend, right? To borrow from McConaughey of the various levels involved, political, the interpersonal, the intersubjective, the intersubjective, which arises from the fact that all of these are citizens in some form or another as actors, as wives, you know, within the fiction. Um, I'm wondering because we sometimes see a similar dramatic situation arising with these kind of inter internal dramas, whether we're looking at Acardians or Thesmophoria Zeusai, which you both mentioned as highlighting some of that transparency or incompleteness of the persona that's being involved. But then also speaking to your interest in materiality and objects and things, uh, moments like in Wasps, when there is the home um, uh, trial of the dog Labes as a kind of Cleon figure, and they're working through the various layers of that. Because we're going to have a hard time giving a, a true, a deep, an emancipated subjectivity to the sort of experience that we have in a household domestic farcical analog. Is there still something there where we're asked to have a almost you know transhuman identification with these things? How, how are those dynamics, uh, which you elucidate very interestingly here, applied in situations where the, the, hum the humanness of the participants or their use of objects becomes part of the blend, uh, but in ways that might add some ripples into the, um, the inner subjectivity of it all. Gosh. <laughs> um, so, sorry. I, <laughs> no, it was, it was I, sprawling. Um, I, I don't know what to, what to insert that. <laughs> 
But to, to go back to the idea of blending um, or melting of different identities, um, I think that that's something I, I, I picked up also in my own <laughs> talk by listening to me. I think it's, um, we have to think also of the spectators not, you know, as um, very defined and monolithic um, um, people or identities. And it's, it's, I think it's, uh, it's visible how the plays try to, how the play tries to super, superimpose the also different layers of identities for the spectators. And so that's something that I would like to investigate further. So I, I didn't make any, any other connection between objects and humans uh, here. So, um, but uh, there, yeah, so may, maybe have to think about that. Um, yeah, it was a left field later. question to be applying subjectivity to cheese graters, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it is. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Again, I want to encourage people to use the chat um, or raise their hand. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for letting me know that I wasn't just incapable of finding the hand, that it truly doesn't exist for me. So can I bring a, oh. Sorry. Oh, yes. Um, is it uh, Olga or Olya? Olga, Olga is perfect, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. We yes. can, thank you. Um, so thank you so much for the presentation. It was extremely interesting. Um, you mentioned um, subjectivity of the spectators and how you'd like to investigate the different modes in which um, that becomes also an aspect that is negotiated through each performance. Um, and I wonder if for Ecclesiastica, you could also speak a little bit about ways that um, gender divides and kind of a, um, the uh, concept of gender um, in spectators and, and um, from the point of view of the spectators watching the play is also negotiated and how that interplays with their subjectivity or just say a little bit more about that because obviously that's yeah. a big, uh, a big. You know, yes, thank you so you're much. right. Thank you for this question. I think it's very important too. And uh, so first in, in the first prologue, we have the teacher who is a woman, so Praxagora. And then we have these, um, these other internal spectators, which are who are male, so Glepirus and Crinus. And it probably impacts the way the, the external audience connects with the, the internal one. Um, and, but I, I wouldn't say that because Praxagora is a woman, there is necessarily a distance because I was thinking of the character of Lysistrata too. And um, I think um, the identification with the Lysistrata was maybe stronger, but it's possible you know, even for male, for mostly male audience. But um, so, but I think it's very important that Crimis and Lepiros are male bulotai, or they, they have served on the council because it, it really helps to create a bridge between the, the external and the internal audience. And they, yes, and it's all also related with the, um, this blends between political and spectatorial competencies because, um, yeah, yeah, they're citizens, whereas women are not. So it's important to make this connection to have male internal spectators, I think. But Thank maybe you, very you, much. you have some ideas on this too? Uh, yeah, no, I think, like you said, um, I, I hadn't really immediately thought about another divide, important divide that you mentioned, the fact that um, the, the political subjectivity, right? So the political uh, role that is lacking in one gender and then in the other. And obviously that's a big question in itself, what the, the composition of the, of the spectators in terms of gender itself. Um, but if, if we assume that they will be watching, definitely that would be um, a big, 
component in the way that they would interpret uh, um, the play, definitely, yes. Thank you so much. Thanks. We maybe have time for one more quick or pointed question. If not, I think what we'll do is delay some of the conversation to the synthetic kind of plenary session at the very end. Uh, we're now at 11 for, or 1040 Chicago time. Uh, so it's time for a five minute break. Uh, at 1045, we'll be back for Krishni's talk. Uh, and then Marianne's response will be coming up at 1125. So feel free to take a break, recaffeinate, and we'll see you all at 1045 Chicago time. Until then. Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Thanks. So in my heart of hearts, I'm really dying to know more about the semiotics of ferrets. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, and the fact that this isn't the famous Galen reference in Aristophanes, which probably- Yes, also, yeah, you're wrong. right. The, the, there is this joke with the orator, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's again a double level of um, humor because there might be also a reference to the to this joke. Yeah, it's yeah. I guess that is. I wonder how much they're thinking about that actor twenty years on. What were how how much could the the memory, the confidence of these audiences be? Yeah. I'm sorry my question was so out of left field, Anne-Sophie, uh, but I'm, I'm very interested in the subjective states we give or afford objects um, in our own engagement with them when we see something as having a face, when we start treating the mask as having a kind of persona or identity. Um, and I think there's something, there, there's a real chasm that needs to be crossed between human and non-human. Uh, but I think theater is constantly asking us to play with that. Um, mm. yeah, but, yeah, sorry, I, I love this uh, cheese grater scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, it, it's very fun. I mean, uh, also, yeah, because I, he's, you know, it, it's mute. And so there is also a play on, um, on um, what he's speaking or what is, yes, what he's speaking in the theater. And can an object speak? Yeah. So it's great. <laughs> Krishni, do we need to have any technical thing? I'll need to stop sharing my screen, obviously, at some point. This is just kind of the interact. Um, so I've got a super fancy setup that should allow me to share my screen. All right, I will stop sharing mine so that you're connected. Also going to see if I can drop a an image of the um, play poster into the chat. I'm not sure if it will allow me, but can't hurt to try. The answer is no. And we're about one minute from returning to the panel. Oh no, I was mute. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're back now. Oh, I'm glad I noticed that before I started giving my paper. Hmm. 
I feel like the Ecclesia Zeusai audience is expected to be super confident spectators. Not just because of the ferret joke, but most backstage shows assume that you have super confident theater going audiences, mm. at least today. Yeah, there's the, the Pareto dynamic to be considered of the majority of theater goers are the ones who go to the majority of productions uh, so that you're, you have a selection bias built in. I wonder. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure that a good portion of those former, former chorus members make up the majority of the Athenian audiences, not for any uh, real meaningful reason, but just because yeah. they would. Yeah. I see Josh on the chat bringing in that he can vouch for theater, <laughs> theater people supporting theater. Um, it's a 1045, so it's time for us to resume. And it's once again, my honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker. Krishni Burns is lecturer in Latin and the Department of Classical and Medieval Studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, she is actually where our conference is supposed to have been. Her research considers the lives of women and religious practices in the Roman Republic, issues highlighted both in her forthcoming uh, monograph on the Magna Mater Romana, as well as this seminar's paper. As chair of the SCS Committee on Ancient and Modern Performance, which has the excellent acronym of CAMP, Dr. Burns is especially busy at this joint conference. And I'd be quite remiss if I didn't plug not only her panel, Ancient Theater in Chicagoland, which begins today at two o'clock central time, but also the dramatic reading of Euripides' Helen, which Krishni is organizing alongside the also inimitable Mary Kay Gamble and John Franklin. You'll have to wait until 6 p.m. local time on Thursday for her Helen, uh, but Dr. Burns's paper, Sharing Spectatorship with the Divine, Watching as Worship at the Ludi Megalenses, begins right now. Take it away, Krishni. All right. Uh, thank you so much to Alan and Sophia for giving me the opportunity to be part of this really exciting panel. Uh, also to our respondent, Mary Ann, who uh, gave me some really stimulating feedback. All right, uh, so I'm going to read fast. Everybody, please brace yourselves. So this paper will consider the effect on Roman audiences of sharing the spectating experience with the Magna Deum Mater Idea during the theater games at her Republican festival, the Megalensia. Cognitively, the process of spectating is a social experience. It reinforces social bonds between audience members and between the audience and the actors through shared and mirrored emotion. I will argue that by watching the Ludi Megalenses together with the cult statue of the Magna Mater, the Roman audience knowingly engaged in a modified form of transcendent worship. As a result, the audience had a heightened sense of the play's production qualities that challenged the performance's ability to fully engage its spectators' attention. To avoid the religious penalty that a failed performance would have engendered, the Megalencia productions made use of performative techniques to increase the audience's response to characters. So first, let me establish some parameters. I will focus on the second century BCE when the Ludi Megalenses were held on the Palatine Hill directly in front, in front of the Magna Mater's main temple. During this time, five extant plays are known to have been produced at the goddess's games. The earliest is Plautus's Sidilus, which was performed at the dedication of the temple in 191 BCE. The other four plays are all by Terence, the Andrea, the Hakura, the Haoton Timoromenus, and Eunicus. In my ambitious first draft, I intended to analyze all of these texts, but I have found that I only have space to squeeze in one brief example from the Pseudolus. Uh, one final note, as C.W. Marshall points out, scripted drama as specifically a religious phenomenon is still new to Rome when the Pseudolus was first produced. Uh, it was only really established with the introduction of drama to the Ludia Apollinares in 212, so just 20 years prior. Celebrating the Magna Mater with the annual theater games at her state festival was therefore a conscious innovation by the Roman state. 
Now, let us turn to the Ludi Megalenses Palatine venue. The Magda Mater dominated the spectating environment of the performances just mentioned. These plays were staged in a temporary theater erected specifically for the Megalensian games. Uh, here is Patrizio Pensabene's reconstruction of the temple. And that orange rectangle represents roughly where the stage might have been. The Kawea consisted either in whole or in part of the steps leading up to the temple, and the temple's double doors into the cella were open to allow the cult statue inside an unobstructed view of the performances. The environment in which plays are produced is a major factor in the cognitive experience of spectating. Spectators are encultured, uh, enculturated to respond in specific ways to the rituals of arriving at the performance area. While the extant behaviors of audience members may vary by culture, um, the process of entering the designated spectating area, finding the right seat, acquiring the appropriate comestibles, acclimating to the localized soundscape, and making, taking in visual details of the environment all prime the spectators' brains to engage with the stimuli of the performance with focused attention and emotional receptivity. However, during the Ludi Megalenses, the Magna Mater dominated the physical environment of her games. The space was doubly a templum, first as the cult center's permanent designated precinct, and second as the temporary sacred space of the games themselves. Crossing into the spectating area would have been a familiar religious ritual to the Romans and reinforced the audience's awareness of the venue as a conceptually distinct space. The genre of scripted theater was still new to the Romans, but watching some form of performance at other religious festivals was long established custom. In some, when they entered the theater, they were primed to think magna mater more readily than Plautus. Not only were the seats and the view specifically the magna maters, her cult statue was physically present as part of the audience, defining the outside limit of the theater area. The Magna Mater's cult statue was forcibly linked to the embodied goddess, even more so than other cult statues. According to various later sources, Livy, of course, most prominent, uh, the Magna Mater was transported from Asia Minor to Rome in the form of a basaltic meteorite. Arnobius claims that the stone was worked into the head of the Palatine cult statue. Between the statue and the temple, the entire setup ensured that the audience would retain a heightened sense of the Magna Mater's presence, even as the plays tried to engage their attention. That sense of shared spectatorship was so important to the festival that the Roman government, oh, actually, there's the temple, uh, that the Roman government went to costly and innovative lengths to preserve the statue's line of sight after pressures of space led to a change in venue. When the temple complex was remodeled in 111 BCE, the games moved to the Circus Maximus directly below. Rather than moving the cult statue every year, the temple's podium was increased to the unprecedented height of 8.4 meters. That's 27 and a half feet and the temple's pedimental sculpture was replaced with an image of a celesternium to maintain the line of sight. So the sculpture doesn't survive, but we do have this image. Uh, this is a plaster cast of a relief that is built into the facade of the Villa Medici. Its provenance is uh, unknown, although it appears to be Augustine in date. Regardless, there is little doubt that it depicts the Magna Mater's temple. As you can see, it consists of a draped chair in the center, flanked by Gali leaning on Timpana and by lions. The central chair is the Celesternium. Uh, it's a Hellenizing form of the Roman Lecasternium ritual. In a Celesternium, uh, an upright chair, rather than a Roman banqueting couch, is draped with a cloth to represent the seated deity. The seat is thereafter reserved for the divinity and takes on some of the embodied Newman of a cult statue until the fabric is removed. Uh, since this cloth is literally carved in stone, the Celesternium is permanent. Uh, here's the line of sight. So 
Permanently reserving a seat for the Magna Mater on her own roof demonstrates that watching the Ludi Megalenses with the Magna Mater's cult statue was an essential feature of the festival in the minds of participants. And thank you to the Beasley Archive for these images. So given the importance of watching the Megalentia plays with the Magna Mater, the social cognition of spectating uh, at plays is critical, or plays a critical role in the religious dimension of this festival. In the Hellenistic world, this goddess was honored through secret initiation rites. These rites emphasized transcendent experiences that included uh, a state of altered reality in the worshiper, induced a state of altered reality in the worshiper, uh, often through music and energetic dancing that caused dizziness and disorientation. This fifth century volute crater depicts the Magna Mater's Greek equivalent, Kibele, seated next to a male god, who is maybe Sabazios? We're not sure. Uh, surrounded by musicians and dancers. Note that the dancers share a number of iconographic features with Bacchants. Bacchants and Kibele's dancers, the Korribants, are often linked. Um, here's a textual example that speaks to the transcendence of Kibele's Hellenistic cult from Plato's Ion. Plato calls inspired poets uh, Entheoi Antes and Katakomenoi, then compares them to Korribants who uk emphrones antes or orkuna Greek or kunantai. There we go. Uh, they dance out of their minds. <clears throat> In contrast, the Romans introduced the temple, introduced the worship of this goddess as a state religion, and the highly individual transcendent experience of Hellenistic practice just didn't suit the Megalensia's civic character. Theater offered a way of collectively engaging in a conceptually similar form of worship. So theater itself is experienced by spectators in two frames, which we've been talking about uh, during this panel. We've got the outer frame of the production and the inner frame of the play itself. As Anne-Sophie has just demonstrated, when the actors perform, they create a liminal space where they are both themselves, i.e. actors, and the characters whom they portray. Bruce Konecki uses the phrase blended identities to describe the actor character's dual state in the minds of the audience. Spectators participate in that liminal space by accepting the actor's dual identities, willfully suspending disbelief for the space of the performance. Through the dialogue of belief between actor and the audience, the secondary world of the play is created. The audience includes the magna mater, so she becomes part of that audience collective. Together, audience and cult statue experience the liminal space of spectating as a form of communal transcendence. And yet, the environment of the theater, the Magna Mater's temple, and the watching cult statue would have handicapped the whole endeavor. It would have elevated the audience's stress levels just enough to trigger a slight neurophysiological response, which would have caused an increase in the audience's sensory input as regards their surrounding environment. Um, compare this to the experience uh, that you get when you're watching student presentations and your department chair drops in to observe the class. You're still watching the student, but you tend to feel a little bit more self-conscious about the quality of their work. In essence, having a notoriously touchy goddess looking over their collective shoulder heightened the audience's awareness of the outer frame just enough to draw its focus from the inner frame. In McConaughey's terms, um, it shifted the balance of the blend toward the actors and the production away from the characters and the narrative. It would have required some effort on the actor's part to warm up the audience, i.e. to engage enough of the audience's attention to successfully rebalance the scales and induce the necessary theatrical transcendence. Comedy, particularly scripted comedy, depends on high levels of social cognition for its success. Mechanically, laughter is induced by a slight rise in tension, then a release when the tension is negated. However, 
MRI scans of subjects while they watch stand-up comedy clips show increased neural activity in the reward centers of the neural, neural cortex that mimic the brain's response to social bonding. Uh, Mrs. Maisel was not one of the comics used. This image is just a good illustration. The more highly rated, funnier clips produced a greater response in the brain. That suggests that, cognit that cognitively, uh, humor, the humor response exists in humans as a way to incentivize social bonding. The experiment confirms a long recognized pattern in humor studies. Uh, successful stand-up comics often use rhetorical techniques that make the audience feel like they're participating in a conversation. They address the audience directly, they make eye contact, they ask rhetorical questions. These techniques rely on social cognitive phenomena, again, mirrored emotion and embodied cognition, to elicit connection, paving the way for humor. Such comics depend on a certain physical proximity to their audience to establish that connection. The audience must be close enough to read the comic's facial expressions and make eye contact. Furthermore, an audience also becomes more responsive if its environment enforces a sense of connection between its individual members. A room must reach a certain capacity, depending on the room size, uh, in order to maximize its responsiveness. You may actually have noticed the, this law of critical mass in your own classrooms. However, that number decreases if the audience is composed of individuals who are already familiar with each other and or the comedian performing. With prior familiarity, there's no need to induce a sense of false cohesion. Physical proximity between audience members can also affect their engagement. The closer the audience members are to each other, like packed in together, the greater their response, regardless of room size. The Megalencia audiences were certainly in close proximity to the stage, although in their case, the actor's body language, not their facial expressions, is the stimulus for embodied cognition. The Megalencia's playing space was at most about 15 meters deep, and the scene backdrop behind would have reduced that space even further. Also, spectators would have been forced into very the very close proximity ideal for comic performance. Uh, Sander M. Goldberg estimates that spectators would have had about 40 centimeters or 16 inches of step per person. That would have only allowed for 1600 audience members uh, if they all squeezed in or about 1300 if uh, they needed some elbow room. Given the prevalence of nepotism among the Republican factions in the second century, the audience pool would have uh, been limited to well-connected citizens and their entourages. Additionally, it's clear from various lines in Plautus' plays that the social hierarchies of the seating area were already observed at the time, even if they had not yet been codified into Roman law. Audience members would have been sitting near people who moved in similar social circles. Even if they were not friendly with their seatmates, they would have been surrounded by familiar faces. The audiences were packed in together. The steps were filled with the same people they, that saw each other at other civic and religious rites. It should have been ideal for comic performance. Oh, sorry. Scrolling. Uh, so the text of the Megalencia plays should not have had it to make extensive use of strategies to collect and hold the attention of the audience uh, that stand up comedies use on sparse rooms of strangers, yet they do. Between the Eunicus's remarkable success and the Hikura's catastrophic failure, uh, it's clear that the Megalencia audiences required careful management. Terence's prologues get steadily longer over time and try to engage the audience's fellow feeling and snobbery by denigrating another playwright's taste. Attacking a third party is one of the quickest ways to build social bonds. It seems that the positive effects of capacity, proximity, and familiarity could not counteract the impact of the religious stakes on the audience's neurophysiognomy. So let's take a well-known speech of the Sudless as the promised example of how to catch and hold the attention of a disengaged audience. Plautus's Sudless actually breaks dramatic convention by having the clever slave be comically inept at carrying out his schemes. 
once the audience was engaged, the twist would have constantly surprised the audience and heightened their comic response. So you get the tension of expectation and then the release of the surprise. Yeah. However, such innovation comes with the danger that the audience might lose the thread of the plot if they weren't fully engaged from the outset. Remember, scripted drama is still new, and there were only 11 days of Ludi Skaneki a year in 191. And the more established dramatic forms like mime had really short, very simple plots. The pseudolist of spectators would not have the entrenched tradition of theatrical competence to easily decode the actions of a plot time play once they lost the thread of the narrative. Plautus is making a gamble to keep his audience attention, but first he's got to earn it. So Plautus uses two techniques to focus his audience's attention. At the very beginning, he hedges his bets with a short prologue that prepares his audience for the length of the coming production. He says, you'd better get up and stretch your loins. A long Plautine play is coming on stage. Second, Plautus counters the danger of losing a distracted audience by bringing the titular character forward to signpost to the action of the play. In a much studied passage, which Neil Slater calls the poet's soliloquy, Pseudolus draws attention to himself as a playwright figure through the use of, the metaf of a metaphor familiar to his audience from different performance contexts. He compares himself to a poet. He says, just as a poet, when he has caught, on, caught up his tablets, seeks something which exists nowhere among mankind, yet finds it, and makes a thing which is false like a truth. Now I will become a poet. Twenty minae, which now exists nowhere among mankind, I will find them yet. Slater has pointed out that the metatheatricality of the passage uh, and the fact that it dominates the audience's perception of all subsequent events. Chris Bungard has taken the analysis a step further and argued that the passage orients the audience so that they can follow the semi-improvisational style of this adaptation. The passage breaks the fourth wall to directly engage the audience, then offers the audience simple instructions on how to decode the rest of the production. They should focus on Pseudolus as their guide and understand all events is dependent on his initiative, i.e. his attempts to get his hands on the necessary cash. The use of direct address and the invocation of a, a familiar shared experience, hearing a poet recite, uh, established the essential bond between the spectators and the actor character on stage to counter the pull of the goddess in the back. In conclusion, a Megalentian play must thoroughly engage Roman audiences in order to ensure that the play successfully created that all important blended theatrical experience necessary for theatrical transcendence. When Roman audiences watched the Ludi Megalenses together with the Magna Mater, not only did they enjoy a good show, they also shared a moment of communion with their goddess. At the same time, Megalensia spectators were stimulated by their spectating environment to focus on the outer frame of the production. That hyper-awareness would have ensured a deep investment in the excellence of the production quality and a critical, often boisterous reception uh, of the quality of the performance. Faults in performance, flaws in production, and flat comic routines would have impeded the audience's engagement and therefore their transcendent experience. Roman actors countered that danger through a variety of strategies to engage the audience, which, at least for Plautus as Pseudolus, balanced these opposing forces and brought the proverbial house down. Thank you. Wow, Christian, what a way to end that. <laughs> uh, so many things to think about. I see the hands uh, clapping. Of course, we'll want to convert those into the hands of inquiry here soon. Um, I want to give some space for that. Um, but but I'll bring up something that Anne-Sophie mentioned uh, in our conversations beforehand, which is that for the, the Athenocentric audience members here, we naturally think of the cult statue of Dionysus here. There are other statues around. Um, how 
is there anything particular about the Mater and its location beyond maybe what you've shared that you think makes this a, a particularly distinctive thing? Or is there maybe something that's just going to be common within religious practice under the watchful eyes of the Agalmata, the, uh, the statues that are part of the ancient uh, cityscape? So what I think I want to emphasize is that uh, it's not the statue that is news so much as um, this kind of collector transcendent worship. Like there's no um, there's no precedent for that. And you know how the Romans feel about new things. They're dangerous. Um, so there, and this is entirely, this is a false creation. Like it's a state initiative to bring the goddess in. They basically create this festival from whole cloth. So at the outset, there's this feeling of we're trying something new. This is unusual for us. It's fairly high stakes whether this will work. Um, so I think that's, it's not that it really scares them, but it's enough for you, them to come in worrying, I really hope this play works. I really hope that we actually achieve this religious state that we have created in our minds. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not that they're scared. It's just that the stakes are different than they would be in a society that had sort of developed spectating habits over time. Good. And I, I thought your idea of a uh, kind of spectrum within the blend that you're bringing from McConaughey was quite good. I see that uh, John Gruber Miller has a question, and I see his screen has also become uh, live. So would you like to uh, project this in uh, your proper persona, John? I also see a hand from William Duffy. We'll start with John, if that's I, possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Krishna, thanks a lot for this talk. Uh, super job. Um, so I'm thinking about how can you, um, is there any memory of actual religious rites here for the Magna Mater in the same space that the theatrical performance takes place? Is, is there some sort of way that that religious experience affects how we think about the actual um, comic performance. Uh, you've, you've talked about the goddess, but I'm also kind of thinking about what actually happens in that uh, performance space too. So in terms of uh, ritual, it's a little bit difficult to reconstruct. We know that the other major feature of the Roman rites, in addition to the usual inner sacrifice, uh, is the pompa, the procession, which we don't know what the route was, but I would argue that they went down to what, would, what was once the Arno stream. So they kind of went round the hill to the south and then came back up. Um, they also uh, did a ritual washing of the statue. And uh, I don't know if you recall from the image I showed, they did reconstruct a basin, which actually seems to have narrow steps down into the basin over to one side. So there does seem to be some ritual practice in that space beyond just the theater. I can't help but wonder though, uh, the, I mean, then the space of the theater wouldn't have been quite as, would be pretty, not permanent, but you can't like move the stage once it's set up. So I'm wondering how many people were actually able to participate in those rites and watch them, um, especially because a lavatio requires that you actually move a statue around. And if you had people all over the steps, how are you going to get the statue out of it? So logistically, there, is de there are definitely other ritual practices that are taking place in that space along with the games, but I don't know how many people got to participate. Yeah, I kind of <clears throat> can't imagine that there would be a, a way to move the cult statue, though. It seems like there would have to be some sort of like, um, uh, not puppet, but rather, you know, some lightweight kind of thing that's standing in for the statue in that. And it could be that they do that perform or that <laughs> ritual one day and then set up the stage the, the next day or something like that too. Um, mm -hmm. So anyhow, just, I, we probably just don't know enough to be able to uh, come to any conclusion. 
I would definitely agree that there's no way they're moving that cult statue. The good news is the Magna Mater has a lot of small, lighter, weighter objects that more lightweight objects uh, that would be easy to move. If indeed they still had the stone, they could take the stone to the basin. Or we've got lots of evidence that Celestania are a big part of these rituals. So they could take the Celestania cloth down and wash it. Um, I do think it's worth re-emphasizing that maybe they couldn't necessarily watch in the space, but they def everybody could, well, not everybody, but lots of people could watch the Pampa. So there's room. Yeah, thank you. Will, um, William, I see your hand next. <clears throat> uh, so you spoke a bit about how, um, you know, that, that the, our experience is already kind of socially stratified in a kind of a relatively intimate space like this cult. Was it possible to play to what, like to play to one set or another? Like, you know, you guys in the front, you get it. Or that, yeah, that's or actually exactly, that's exactly what happened in the Katiwi. Uh, at the beginning of that prologue, they got the two characters on stage and the prologue's like, hey, so you guys pay attention. I'm gonna explain their relationships. Everybody get it? Well, not you in the back, you should come forward, but the taxpayers in the front, they get it. So you definitely, uh, there's an emphasis on people who are sitting more uh, closer, being more the theatrically competent, paying better attention, and I mean, also being higher status. Mm. Not very democratic, that's okay, it's a republic. Literally stratified audiences there. I see from the chat that Zuzana is bringing up the question of various senses. I see her um, uh, screen has just gone live too. Uh, I don't want to ventriloquize. Uh, would you like to weigh in here? Um, thank you, of course. Um, um, I, uh, although I would enjoy the ventriloquization with my Hungarian accent, thank you. Uh, that would be fun. Uh, but um, um, I th thank you so much again, Krishni, for this wonderful uh, uh, talk. And I just wanted to ask about sort of other sensory stimulation because I was just thinking about how, you know, the gods are supposed to enjoy, say, the smell of sacrifice or something like that. So how do other senses are also sort of paralleling maybe the visual uh, uh, co-stimulation that you are talking about? Well, I think that's so important because of course, against the Magna Mater, this is the goddess of music, particularly drums and timpana. So there's no doubt that acoustics are an essential part of particularly these play experiences. And I had, it's too bad the temple is gone because it would be very interesting to know what the acoustics would have been like in this kind of impromptu theater space. Um, that's definitely a very important part. I wonder a lot about scent because if there's one feature we know about uh, these, this festival, it's that at these games, there were a lot, the audience was really tightly packed in. And this was not a time when um, deodorant was commonly used. So I don't know if they were interested in engaging actively with the sense of smell in this space, uh, they would have had to burn quite a lot of incense, I suspect. We know that people were eating. Although once again, how are we going to sell sausages to this particular crowd when there doesn't seem to be that much space? And uh, I don't know if you saw with the Maison Cui, um, the there were appear to have been uh, sides to the steps they weren't open so you couldn't build pseudo steps up the side to get to the audience members so it's really the the pressures of space for this festival were just so dominating i feel like i'm out of senses Probably thank you that that was a pretty good list thanks 
We're not yet out of time though. So if anyone would like to weigh in now via the chat, if you're feeling a bit shy or uh, via the hand raise function, uh, we'd be happy to have some specific questions for Krishni before we turn to Marianne's presentation or summary response and then our collaborative discussion. Yes, Josh. Uh, hello, yes, thank you for that presentation. Uh, just a, a, sort of a quick thing and not even necessarily a question attached to it. I, I was just sort of struck with the meta theatricality of the uh, um, uh, poet's soliloquy, right, in the pseudolus. I, I was just really struck with that and um, sort of the parabasis of Greek comedies where it's the playwright or performer directly addressing and either asking for a favorable judgment or sort of engaging with that. And so I'm, I'm just kind of curious if that may be, and again, not even necessarily a question, but like if that has some sort of lineage from, um, yeah, like Plautus, from, from Plautus and Terrans sort of borrowing other elements of Greek theater, uh, bringing it to the Romans, if that was maybe something that was imported as well, I don't know. So I mentioned Terence's prologues, which get really lengthy. Um, this, I think they serve a, a similar function. It gives the author a chance to respond directly, or I guess, um, I guess the theatrical agent a chance to respond directly to a lot of outside factors. Um, and it's interesting that often in these prologues, this becomes not just a way to step back and uh, increase this kind of meta theatrical reflection on the production, but this is also a great chance for the uh, for it, uh, someone to warm up the crowd. So the fact that they move this solilo these uh, soliloquies from kind of in the midst of the play as a break from the action to the point to try and first establish that connection right away and get everybody personally invested in the show, I think speaks to the fact that the Athenian audiences, the Greek audience didn't need to work so hard to get their, uh, their audiences engaged, but the Romans had to do it right off the bat. That's a, that's a very good point, thank you. Yeah, that's something I'd like to talk about a little bit more in the after uh, meeting, but uh, I see Matthew Schuler has a question now from the chat. Uh, Matthew, are you ready? Uh, yes, can uh, everyone hear me? Yes. Well, thank you, Christy, for a very interesting, um, a very interesting presentation. Um, these are sort of, what you're talking about are topics of interest to me uh, in, my, in my work. Um, um, public and Roman public entertainment venues. So a question I had is I really like this idea that both the, the you brought up that the performers and even the actors might be a little bit uh, nervous that maybe their performances, the performance doesn't stand up to snuff for the goddess who's sitting right there. And I really like, like this idea and I hadn't thought of it before of this sort of this outer framework and people thinking of that, oh, will the goddess really, uh, will this appeal to the goddess? Um, and so I was wondering if I, my knowledge of <laughs> Roman comedy and Roman plays isn't, isn't as good as I would like it to be. So are there, do you happen to know, are there specific references in the textual sources of maybe just an inkling of this idea, this idea you just mentioned of coming out like a, a poet or a character voicing a, a, a concern that the, the god may not be um, happy with the performance? So... I will say that my knowledge of Roman comedy is also not as good as I would like it to be. Uh, I can't think of any specific reference to, spe to the God who is watching, um, but we do get some uh, kind of non-theatrical references to the religious stakes of the plays. The most famous, of course, is Cicero's comment. Um, after Clodius tries to disrupt the Megalencia games. And Cicero says, how can you do this in the very sight of the goddess? Um, it suggests that even, I mean, Cicero is in hyperbole, um, but certainly this is 
a reasonable attack that Cicero could make and that would land, that you would somehow disrupt the goddess's viewing experience is just not acceptable. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's that, that's a great piece of evidence. Thank you so much. Thank you. I need to read through my five example plays one more time and see if there's anything there. Matthew, I hear we have some people here in Chapel Hill who know a thing or two about Greek, uh, Roman comedy. So we'll, we'll see if we can get some of these things turned up. Thank you, Christy. I think that needs to wrap up our immediate Q&A session. Uh, but of course, we have the big one coming up. Um, and Sophie, I, I, should I turn things over to you now as a master of ceremonies? Yes. So can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so let's move on to the, the final discussion. So it, so it is my joy and honor to introduce our incredibly supportive yet very sharp respondents and panel discussants, as well as my compatriot, uh, Marian Govers Hoffman, who is an associate professor at Northwestern University. So Marian Hoffman is a scholar of ancient Greek culture with an expertise in archaic and classical poetry and special interest in literary theory, feminist studies, animal studies, posthumanism, and the environmental humanities. So she is the author of Scylla, Myth, Metaphor Paradox in 2012, and the co-editor of Choral Mediations in Greek Tragedy 2013, among many other articles on Homer, Athenian tragedy, and Greek hymns. So she's currently in Lausanne on a sabbatical, working on her current book project, entitled Prometheus Gifts, Environment, and Technology in 5th Century Athens. So Mariam, the, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anne Sophie. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you so much for uh, to our speakers for wonderful presentations. And I was really honored to be asked to uh, serve as respondent um, in this panel. It's been really fun to um, witness the development of the papers and uh, to uh, think uh, through the work together. So um, I see my job here as uh, proposing some elements that will help us uh, toward a general discussion, uh, starting to bring the papers together and uh, uh, think about spectatorship in antiquity uh, in general. Um, so what I would like to do is to highlight some of the mythological moves that I see uh, that the papers have made um, uh, to prompt us to think about possible ways to approach uh, spectatorship and um, as sort of to um, um, answer the prompt for the panel that uh, Al and, and Sophie highlighted in their introductions. That is to say, how can we start to develop rigorous ways of, of, of thinking about spectatorship in antiquity despite the relatively meager evidence about the experience of spectating um, be beyond the plays themselves. Um, so as Anne-Sophie reminded us uh, in her introduction, um, the question of spectatorship could be tackled from a variety of points of view, um, uh, noticeably um, from a sociological point of view, uh, which was that of uh, Roselli in his 2011 book, Theater of the People, Spectators, and Society in Ancient Athens, where he really prompted us as to think about um, uh, the audience of the theater of Dionysus as a much more diverse audience than has uh, often been acknowledged. So um, uh, taking into account the presence of women, of metics, of, um, of slaves uh, in the audience. Um, but this, this is not quite the approach that our panelists have chosen to take today. Instead, um, they really, uh, they, they focus more on what we could call perhaps the phenomenology of spectating, uh, the ways in which ancient performances engage spectators, um, how plays trigger cognition. Um, um, they want us to think about the thoughts and the emotions of audiences. Um, 
one specific interest uh, that I think runs through the, the, the presentations is to uh, uh, uncover ways in which spectators were active participants in the construction of theatrical meanings. So um, uh, Al has come up with the concept of deliberative spectatorship um, to describe how spectators uh, facing conflicting descriptions of Oedipus were prompted to think through those discrepancies. Uh, and Sophie draws on a concept developed by Ranciere in a 2008 book, a concept of emancipated spectator, um, uh, where Ranciere responds to the traditional contrast between active performer and passive spectator um, and prompts us to go beyond that contrast uh, and to think about how spectators um, isn't a passive recipient, but rather compares, connects, and quote, composes his own poem with the elements of the poems that he, uh, uh, he's watching. Um, so in what follows, I want to highlight maybe three features um, that struck me as recurring moves shared across the three papers. Um, and perhaps we can use those um, to open up uh, a broader discussion. So the first observation, um, which is a very simple one, um, is that the theme of viewing um, has played an important role in the three presentations that we've heard. So in other words, when prompted to reflect on the multi-sensorial experience of spectatorship involving sight and hearing and other senses, as we just heard Krishni discuss, discuss um, our three panelists nevertheless chose to bring their attention to ways in which the act of viewing the object of the gaze of the internal and external spectators may provide us with a productive point of entry into the phenomenology of spectating. So Al takes as his starting point the question of what the Oedipus of the OC looks like, and he highlights different ways in which internal spectators the Colonian Stranger, the Chorus, Ismini, Theseus, and Oedipus himself respond to the memorable, memorable dreadful sight of the blind Oedipus with his bloody eyes. And Sophie uh, reads the second prologue of the Ecclesiastesi as a scene of, about the observation of observations, and she combines uh, uh, reflections on the uh, words of the characters, but the, the sight, what they see, uh, also plays a very important role. Um, as uh, she describes um, uh, Creamy's response to the women's offstage performance at the assembly and how he uh, misinterprets visual stimuli that the fact uh, the, the pale faces of the women is mistaken as a, um, as a signal or a sign of their identity as shoemakers. Uh, the question of what external spectators see what they, while they attend the performance of the Ludi Megalenses is, of course, central to Christian's paper, who very carefully reconstructs the setting of the Pilatine Hill to show how the statue of the Magna Mater, Mater would have been immediately seen by spectators as they entered the uh, Tavea, and how that, the perception of that presence um, would have really shaped their experience of the um, performances. So um, from what we've heard, sight is good to think with when engaging in questions of spectatorship. It strikes me that um, if we uh, uh, compare the, the presentations with the tradition of scholarship, um, the papers we've heard put or showed relatively little interest in, for instance, how phenomena of intertextuality or allusions would have prompted spectators to play an active role in the construction of dramatic meaning. And that's not that's absolutely not a criticism. It's just, a, I think, uh, maybe a ways for us to think about where the research is going and, and why. Um, and I wonder, for instance, um, if this move to focus on site would, might have to do with an urge to um, uh, move away from an elite approach to spectatorship um, that posits a highly sophisticated and knowledgeable audience to focus on 
visual stimuli that are perhaps more immediate and shared uh, by all. So that's just you know, um, a, a question uh, for our panelists. A second thread um, that I have heard through the papers has to do with, has to do with their interest in inconsistencies on stage or between the stage and its environment as a way um, for the plays to provoke active engagement of the spectators. So Al um, has emphasized inconsistencies among character responses to Oedipus appearance and uh, uh, argued that those inconsistencies encourage external spectators to compare, assess, adjudicate what Oedipus would have looked like. Um, and Sophie analyzes the opening of Assembly Women as, a meta, as meta theater, as a rehearsal that exposes the fragility of the performance that these women will soon be offering offstage um, uh, on the PNICS um, and argues uh, that there are slippages uh, in the women's performance, um, uh, inadequate blending between the actor and the character that would have um, exposed the fictionality of drama and invited spectators to deconstruct uh, the performance itself. So again, to play an active role because of those inconsistencies between the, um, the, what the, what the women are supposed to impersonate and uh, their um, actual um, uh, identity. Krishni um, takes that concept in a way of the emancipated spectator even further um, as because when she argues that the setting of the Ludi Megalenses and the presence of the statue of the Magna Mater may have resulted in over emancipated spectators, right? spectators um, who were at risk of losing focus on the performance and who therefore needed to be um, um, uh, shepherded back into uh, the production through uh, specific um, um, theatrical techniques um, that she analyzes. Um, one thought I had um, was to uh, maybe ask our speakers to think about how the, um, the, the, the sense of the performance as a shared experience um, would have uh, affected the way spectators process those inconsistencies. You know, if uh, I'll, uh, you know, some spectators are wing or, or <laughs> uh, you know, responding vocally to the appearance of Oedipus, how does that play into negotiations of inconsistencies um, uh, across spectators? Um, the third thread I want to highlight has to do with meta theater. Um, all three papers um, have sort of zoomed on meta, meta theater as sort of a privileged site to think about um, spectating. Um, uh, Al arguing that um, the stranger, in a way, is a, a, a model theater goer. Um, uh, who goes beyond superficial appearances and is able to see through, to see the nobleness of Oedipus uh, through the um, uh, repulsive uh, um, exterior appearance. Um, similarly, Anne Sophie encourages us to read um, uh, the second prologue of Eclatazusai as a parody of passive spectatorship, as we. Um, uh, also discussed in uh, after her panel. So uh, prompting spectators to reflect on how um, Queenies misinterprets the performance of the women, um, behave, behaves as a gullible uh, spectator who is unable to detect the many ways in which the women's performance is inadequate. And so um, uh, as Anne Sophie argues, this um, mise en abyme of bad spectatorship would have prompted uh, spectators to be better um, uh, uh, audiences. And uh, Krishni also commented on the metatriarchal uh, dimension of uh, Sodulis um, uh, with the notion that um, the 
uh, playwright needs to actively encourage the audience to um, be as good spectators as they can. So I've been wondering to what extent um, that focus on meta theater can help us um, get a grasp of what the ancient experience, the actual experience would have of, of spectatorship uh, uh, would have been like, or, uh, or to what extent we may, we may want to be careful here um, in, and, and thinking about differences between the way uh, the playwrights may be constructing something like an ideal audience, the normative um, uh, views of spectating and how perhaps we uh, want to keep you know, some distance vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, um, that model of ideal spectator uh, as opposed to what was actually going on in the theaters themselves. So I know um, there are lots of questions, so um, I'll stop here and uh, open up the floor um, for the general discussion, the final discussion in our panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marian. That was very extremely stimulating. Um, so, Obviously, as panelists, we can reply to some of the to some of these suggestions. Um, but I don't know if there is any question from the, the external spectators. And, and as always, uh, one can engage in the chat. I think if we start having a yes. panel discussion, yeah. we don't want that to silence any of the valuable contributions that are mm. going to be coming from the audience. And I interrupted Krishni. What were you going to say? Oh, I was going to point out that um, actually, I think it's directly to me, but Florence brought up uh, the Zoom spectating experience, which I've got to admit, I kind of do want to bring up. Um, just because Zoom has the weird experience, gives us the weird experience of distancing and uh, bringing us closer together at the same time. So thinking about though, uh, Marianne's um, point that in many ways, we are arguing that all of our uh, original productions were trying to construct an ideal spectator. Al, I was wondering with your paper, thinking about the different responses to Oedipus, is there a chance that all of those responses are aimed at a slightly different uh, level, a slightly different group in terms of competency within the audience? Yeah. Um... And picking up on the, the Roselli 2011 kind of references that we've been making to the sociology of this, um, I think the plays themselves do a good job of appealing to a diverse audience and a, you know, fair, whether we define that as their level of competence and their stratification there, social stratification, maybe physically manifested. I also think there's a kind of neurodiversity component to a lot of these things too, where some observations will land with others. That's gonna be uh, overlapping with things like identity of, and uh, cultural positionality. Uh, it may be that the chorus of Colonnaean's elders is more attractive to the Athenian elder than uh, some young person or you know, maybe a woman in the theater. Um, so I, I think there's definitely that. I want to pick up with uh, what Florence and you brought to the table and some something to some extent going back to what Marianne said with the response of Oedipus coming to the stage and everyone saying, ooh, and you have this, you know, 360 response of not only the chorus on stage enacting a play internal response, but if it is a coup de théâtre, you've got the audience going wild around it as well. Zoom does such a good job in an almost, you know, Foucauldian panoptic sense of that we're either all looking at the speaker or we can see each other in these boxes. I can kind of do a, a celebrity squares thing here, uh, but we really don't have a proprioception. We don't have a sense of where we all are, where the focus is, where the center of our group is. This is something that's terribly uh, 
tr transferred into the Zoom format, however grateful I am for that format. I think um, questions of joint attention, this is something that I'm working on elsewhere, are very much at stake at Zoom, where we can't be sure if it's joint attention or simply shared attention. And when are these experiences that we have as spectators shared in the sense that we're all sim experiencing something similar or truly joint collaborative, something that th its very essence is attached to its intersubjectivity. I think that's coming forward in the cognitive literature, in our own experience watching Zoom. Uh, there's a bit of synchronicity on this, but I'm talking too much. <laughs> I am very curious about um, what I'm assuming will be the future work on Zoom spectatorship of this year of Zoom theatrical events we've had. How is this you know, different and how is this similar from live in-person theater? And I see Deborah has a hand, but I want to get the plug in for Helen, 6 p.m. Thursday uh, with uh, Krishni directing. Uh, I, am I, I'm probably stepping out of my place, Marianne, to, to call in Deborah. Um, sure. So, um, uh, Deborah. Sure. Thank you. Um, this is uh, picking up on something what Marianne said about relative inattention to intertextuality and illusion, and also in a couple of comments people made earlier in the chat in relation to your paper, Al. And it, it takes us back to a small point in a very rich and persuasive account. Um, and that is your reading of Danos and your association of Danos with ugliness. Because there's the, the, the play of Danos in the, in the earlier play, both in the parts that were referred to in the chat and also in Oedipus' statement that he would not have been pres preserved except for some Danon Kakon. It's a really central piece of its story and its mysteriousness is part of it, but it, it's hard for me to see making it ugly and it's hard for me not to see that the chorus when they say he's Genaios, except for his misfortune, are comparing his noble appearance with whatever noble means here, with his blindness, mm -hmm. uh, the most obvious part of his misfortune. And that their later reaction to him as someone who, as to, to the, the sort of the Danos part is connected with how utterly shocked the chorus is in the earlier play at the blinding to the extent that it almost drives out of their minds what else is shocking about what's going on with this person. So why, why make Danos into ugliness? Yes, it, it's okay. not nice Ross. Uh, well, cards on the table, I, I'm a hammer in search of a nail with ugliness. That's the monograph, that's been the interest. And you can uh -huh. see how the paper evolved out of my question. Uh, this gets back to something that Matthew Farmer said. You just assume that Oedipus is ugly. Uh, and if you take that assumption and start looking through, well, it, it's uh, multifocal. There's a lot of different perspectives on Oedipus. And not all, the, I think what we can agree upon is that he is Danos. Um, and it's only 500 lines into the play that you're having him ostensibly con, you know, compare his morphic, a, ideal morphic hale <clears throat> to what he actually presents that's getting us close to a Kantian formalist ugliness. But what, ugliness is a concept that I think if we work as an in opposition to beauty, say, and we look at something like David Constant's book on beauty, we're able to see that yes, Greeks had some notion of this. Uh, they're not blind to physical attractiveness or unattractiveness, but that these concepts are entirely imbricated within other cultural value systems, which can involve things like awe, uh, spectacle, uh, worth, uh, values in the largest sense. So I'm, I, I think your critique is very perceptive and very, it's a weak point in, in what I'm presenting, but I still think that audiences attuned to the spectacle of it, attuned to the realization, are going to be very concerned with his appearance. And we're at this methodological dead end that we have no idea what he looked like and we shouldn't even posit one production. 
But ooh, they're going to be interested in what Danos means when it comes to how we're supposed to interpret his appearance. And I would, you know, I, I think everything else unfolded beautifully. I just, it seems to me that you could go else. I mean, horrifying <laughs> is how they're responding. It is horrifying. And that is about his appearance. And it, it I think, works in, and I see a couple of people in the chat have suggested other things. Shocking yes. comes up. <laughs> I think there are appearance words that don't make him sound like, Oh, Socrates, um, to give another complicated example. Um, so I, I think, yeah, it, it, every, I mean, again, everything else unfolded beautifully. I thought the workings of Theseus in relation to this question was, was great. Well, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Danos Legain, which Socrates surely is, is not the same thing as <laughs> Danos. I, uh, I don't know if everyone's seen the um, Antigonic of Ann Carson, oh. but she's got this great moment when they get to the Ode on Man and they say Danos, and then she just runs through a, a synonym list uh, or, you know, it, it's wonderful. It, it's a dangerous word to play with. Out of curiosity, just turning it around, um, is beauty ever shocking or formidable in Greek texts? You're directing Helen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for me, that's it. Uh, and the questions about her beauty, especially before and after her transformation, uh, as she goes from the white robes to black and then from a nymphae to a, a widow, um, it's at stake there. but. Drama, it's hard. Uh, I, I, when I decided to write on ugliness in Greek drama, I didn't realize how elusive it would be. That's why I'm here 10 years on. We've got some interesting comments in the chat. Yes. And good to see friends there. Uh, uh, so Amy was asking about the mask, but I don't want, I'm perhaps missing others. Um, if I can address Amy's question, then, um, you know, she knows better than anyone I know about the, the challenges that are posed to a scale of poios. Uh, we get the bit in Knights 232 where we're talking about the mask maker making a realistic for similitudinous mask with respect to Cleon. Um, I'm struck by the power of these masks. Um, I, I think a lot about the dedication of the skewe at the end of a production, of a victorious production at least, that might have hung in the Dionysian. Um, there's a way that masks might have been reused. Um, obviously, Amy's had to do that a few times or has chosen to do it a few times. Um, there's um, there's a lot about how it may be ugly or beautiful or both. I think that would be a challenge of the mask maker to, to make an Oedipus. How do you blind? I've seen so many terrible Oedipuses uh, these days, not Amy's, uh, but uh, you know, a, a gaudy uh, head wrap, whatever it's going to be. Sometimes they're very effective. Sometimes they're very horrific. Sometimes they're very sanitizing. Um, but I this, think would have, this would be long after that gory yeah. end of OT, which has its own <laughs> technical problems that are fun to try to do. I guess I'm curious, like in the spectrum of what, what the Sophocles audience, what we might think of as lovely or ugly, what would you, putting on, a, on the production, what would you tell your designers or about how nice looking or how um, not nice looking the mask should be or the costume or some contrast between the two. Because you'd have to decide. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the, the producible in interpretation, right? Milhouse and Hume's idea of using that as a, as a way of approaching some of these questions is looms large. Um, it's frustrating because this is a, to get back to a point Marianne was raising about when do we want to engage with the meta theatricality of these? When do we want to see these positings of uh, ideal spectators as really giving us insight or is this somehow circular logic that we're uh, posing on the texts? It, to do honor to the text, Amy, I think you often try to preserve the ambiguity. 
you try to leave things open, leave open the interpretive values or, or options so that you don't offend a uh, stakeholder uh, in the play. But I don't think that works. I think you have to make a bold decision and say, we're making a ugly Oedipus or we're making a lovely Oedipus and it becomes a, a, a different question. Why are people so hung up over his face? It's really not that bad. They're being ableist, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, I, I think you're gonna find yourself making a decision and then the ramifications just play out. I think that you're, but I think one of the things your paper suggests, though, is that you all, that there's an argument for leaving it, trying to do something ambiguous, so that the play and the spectators of of thinking how to see it is still it is all the more possible, I, you know. So I, I can I can see it both ways from from your from your presentation. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I know Toff Marshall always brings up just how myopic so many of the spectators must have been, and these things would have been ambiguous for half of the audience beyond the 20 yard mark. Um, so there, there's a way that we can wor worry about the fine details. That's another way that we could stratify the audience and their competency, uh, who's got 2020 vision and who's seeing blobs on stage. Um, in our, def well, in their defense, I guess, um, our eyesight is much worse now than it was in the past because we <laughs> spent too much time indoors. Artificial light, it's ruining your eyes. Um, can we, can we like bring in the Oedipus Tyrannus stick in terms of interpreting Oedipus as, of, at Colonus's mask? Like the last time that the audience kind of saw Oedipus, he was, you know, covered in gore. So I wonder if the interpretation of his mask, what makes it ambiguous is the, yeah, he looks not great, but better than the last time. And so he does try to push that image to the forefront. Yes, uh, agreed. And, and it, it, assuming that Oedipus, the king is winning and that the skew is dedicated, it's a new mask. I mean, he has to, to work with this. It's been a quarter century. It's not holding up that well. Um, but uh, to get to another point that I'm now recalling from the chat, there was there, there were a lot of Oedipuses. There were Euripidean Oedipuses. I mean, this is tragic canon, um, but it's also uh, Sophoclean in a distinctive way. And I, I tried to avoid using the word Sophocles because authorships obviously debated about the OC with respect to either Yophon or Sophocles, uh, two generations on who's producing it. Um, others can speak much more eloquently to this than I can, uh, but it's clearly a retrospective play. And I think that the end of OT, it's memorable to us, thanks to Aristotle and, and the vagaries of um, how the texts have been transmitted. But I think it must have been pretty memorable even at the time. Um, but but that, that's my opinion. This was a very interesting uh, observation in the chat from Josh about how the uh, open setting of the open air setting of the uh, performances may have given more agency to the audience. And I wonder, Josh, this is such an interesting observation. Would you like to maybe elaborate? Uh, yeah, and, I, and I'll feel better about it because my pet cat that was screaming at me has now run away, so he won't be interrupting. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just considering, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a theater PhD student uh, sort of classics adjacent coming in. And, and one of the things that's really been impressed upon me is, um, yeah, the, the, both the transition to interior performance spaces um, and artificial lighting, as well as, um, yeah, the, the more sort of proscenium stage that we're perhaps more familiar with and how directors and actors are able to use those conventions as, as well as things with like lighting design choices and things like that. Um, they, they have much more at their disposal to direct an audience's attention um, than, yeah, if you're just sitting on a hill watching something. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's, and, and I don't know if there would be any real evidence that we could bring up um, to, to sort of provide an insight as to what an audience member might have as, as well as you know in, in the theater world um so so there's just about every single play seems to have some sort of talk back after the performance 
where audiences are discussing the themes or what jumps out of them. And I think that's also something that, um, yeah, and unfortunately, um, I, I don't know if we'll have any evidence of something like that, where we have records of conversations that about a play afterwards and sort of the different meanings that may have come out of those conversations or um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking along, I guess to, to summarize it, the sort of meaning that gets constructed even after the performance. Oh, there he goes again. I don't know if you can hear him. <laughs> so I'll guess I'll go ahead and mute and we'll see, see what other people, what, what that might generate in other people. Maybe I can reply to that. If, um... Um, and I try also to connect this with um, the thread of Marian, the shared experience. And I think indeed that part of this shared experience was maybe built after the performance. And it's, it's just vertiginous to, to try to think at um, what did, what the spectators did after the show. And we don't have, unfortunately, a lot of sources about this. But um, one of them I can think of is the way I think in Tesmophoria Jussi or in Frogs. Um, so the, the, the characters speak about the ways um, women, women are the, at home, the, how the wife and the, the husband will talk about the shows and how the, the husband will be angry against the woman because uh, on stage um, you're... Um, that the women ha have been shown as bad and, and so on. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's something, it's a, it's a question that we also initially wanted to, to, to explore that were, how to also enlarge our definition of what is a spectator, because it's not only just attending the show, but it, it's also a, a range of spectatorial presences beyond the immediate theater. And it, it also affected the, the performance. So thanks very much for this uh, remark. <clears throat> I mean, of course, we're completely sidestepping the, uh, the judges in the Athenian theater games. So that's a big like um, post theater assessment of the experience. There's so much more I know we can't say, but mm -hmm. I, I think this is our time, isn't it? I might be confused on uh, Eastern to Central. No, it's time. It's, it is time. Yeah. <laughs> we, should, we should end. Well, thank you all. Yeah, big uh, applause to our audience. Thank you for a vibrant discussion, for coming, for embracing our new modality here. Uh, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us that we'd love to continue the conversation via email, other things, these things are accessible. Any questions you have, any further things you'd like to follow up. And Sophie, what am I missing? Marianne, Krishni. Uh, no, so thank you. Thank you very much for attending. And I, I look forward to seeing some of you in other drama panels um, over the, the next few days. Yes, including theater in Chicago land, 2 p.m. Chicago time. Krishni will be uh, holding that one down. Thank you all panelists. Thank you, Marianne, for brilliant and insightful comments. You all yes. did so much to keep this going. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>